and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, gang? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Great to have you with us. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus. We've got a busy show today. Um, really looking forward to bringing Jeff Hamilton on. Uh, Hammer's got a great C- his, uh, CFL column in the Winnipeg Free Press on everything happening around the league. We'll certainly touch on that as well as the Blue Bombers as they uh, enjoy their first bye week of the year. Uh, And we'll also talk to Jeff about the latest with the Jets, and I'm very much looking forward to get his perspective on what we heard from Mark Scheifele yesterday and uh, the Jets heading into the upcoming training camp and upcoming season. Um, Still, with very few additions to the roster, with the exception, of course, of the big off-ice edition yesterday, and of course, Sarah Orleski moving on from TSN to the Winnipeg Jets. So Hammer's coming up later on, and I got to tell you, um, we have talked golf. I mean, we always talk golf. I love golf, but there are so many insane stories in the world of golf right now between the PGA Tour, Liv. Obviously, we've got a big golf tournament here with Mark Scheifele playing in it. That's why he spoke yesterday, and now maybe the most ridiculous lawsuit that's ever been filed. Patrick Ree's $750 million defamation suit against Brandel Chambly in the Golf Channel. Um, we'll get to a bunch of stories in the BMW Championship with our guy Mark Zacchino, who's back from the uh, FedEx Championship last week in Memphis. He's going to join us a little bit later on in the program. We'll hit the cool bet line. Some big movement in the Canadian Football League, actually, since Dusty and I did the lock shop yesterday. Uh, and we'll, we'll also get ready for tonight at the track with the Cinnaboya Downs towards the end of the program. Um, listen, before we get going, first things first, we have to thank all the wonderful local sponsors that make Winnipeg Sports Talk happen each and every day, including Vita Health Fresh Market, Wallace & Wallace, Epp Apparel, Culligan Water, Royal Sports, Little Brown Jug, Boston Pizza, the Nick & Nicky DQ Group, Princess Auto, Breezy Bend, Royal Sports, Assiniboia Downs, Canadian Club Whiskey, and of course our betting partners over at Cool Bet Canada. And uh, getting a little Culligan water in right now, trying to stay hydrated. Getting ready for what should be uh, a nice night at the ballpark. Uh, perfect timing for the Gold Eyes, by the way. Had that monster storm roll through on Monday, which basically shut everything down. Well, that was the one day off for the Gold Eyes on this homestand. Lost last night to the Kansas City Monarchs. Couple big games in this series coming up. I think we're going to head out to the ballpark tonight, so if you're out there, definitely let me know. But um, we do have lots of CFL news to get to. We will talk uh, on the local scene, uh, Valor FC and the Bombers with some big news. And unfortunately, some uh, very sad news for a Winnipeg legend and CFL player, which we'll get to right away. And we do expect, as we're live now, if you're watching later on, um, this has already happened, but... At 127, 1327 to be exact, we're expecting an announcement from the Winnipeg Jets on what is expected to be Tamu Solani and Teppo Newman going into the Winnipeg Jets Hall of Fame. So uh, that's certainly what people are expecting with the timing of the announcement at 1327. Uh, but we'll wait on that until a little later on and have it for you um, as soon as it becomes official and available here on WST. And then Hammer and Z-Man will join us on the program. Let's get down to business. Welcome everyone in on YouTube. Thanks so much for being with us. Hit that red subscribe button if you are a new viewer, if you found us somewhere. We're live every day at 1 o'clock here in Winnipeg. And of course, if you're not able to catch the YouTube broadcast, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you get your pods uh, and just simply search Winnipeg Sports Talk. Hit that subscribe button and uh, it's free. You'll get the new, fresh Winnipeg Sports Talk content each and every day. Let's get Remus in here. 
who's all excited to finally get away and take a day off for the first time. Remo, what's up? Yeah, I'm off. Uh, I'll be out of here Friday and taking some time next week. We're arranging the logistics of that as well. But 1327, the time, perfect time to announce the Kyle Wellwood, Eric Tangrady number uh, honoring. Shout out to Ezra Ginsburg for coming up with that one. So it'll be <laughs> very good. Although I was looking at 13s and 27s, but who else it could be? There's really only been two 27s who've, or two people who've worn 27 for the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Jets 2.0, uh, Tangrady and Ehlers. Thorburn was 27 with the Thrashers, but that ended in 2011. What about Don Spring? Who's that? Was Don Spring not a former Winnipeg Jet that well, wore two, Winnipeg Jets 2.0, 2.0. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, well, Newmanen and Solani weren't 2.0. I mean, what about Who's, other 13s and 27s oh, in well, Jets hockey, history? Well, Hockey Reference only has, uh, I clicked on Winnipeg Jets uh, 2.0. They're separate, so I have to open a different page for that one. <laughs> t- so it only has... So it only has, I'll tell you the 13s from 2.0. Tanev. Tanev's the other one, yeah. And then there's two others. Um, one of them just changed his number. I don't think his number would be honored anytime. PLD? Yeah. <laughs> and one, I don't think, did he sign with someone this offseason who wore 13 this past season? Excuse me? Zach Sanford? Did he oh, sign? Zach Sanford. He's, oh, that's he signed right. somewhere and took a pay cut, didn't he? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think he may have signed for league minimum. Do a quick check on that while we uh, okay. while we see what's going on. Tico Napoli says Don. Okay, we got everyone in chat writing about. So I have to go to the Arizona Coyotes. Tico Napoli, was I right? Don Spring? Don Spring is right. All right, there you go. Okay. I'm good with numbers. If you tell me a guy's name, I can usually remember his number pretty good, even from the early Winnipeg Jet days. It's a little different, though, when you get a number and you have to give a list of all the players that did wear it. But it is very, it is a fun game. The The numbers game is uh, is always fun. And we've got, we've it, definitely got time for it here on WST. It's actually kind of crazy looking at the Coyotes um, franchise history on Hockey uh, Reference. No one's worn 27 there since Teppo Newman. Uh, he wore, ended in 2003. And that was it. Yeah, well, no kidding. It's only been... Uh, Harry Turnbull, someone else said in chat, he was 27 from 85 Turnbull. to 87. Oh, good call, good call. And the other one, Lorne Stamler, wore it in 1980. So that's, but then right. after that, uh, Coyotes said done, no more 27. Well, yeah, I mean, Teppo Newman was the all-time, I mean, isn't it retired? Probably. I mean, he's yeah, all, one I, of the all-time leaders for the absolutely, Jets Coyotes. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, he, you know, and he legitimately did most of it in Phoenix. I mean, you know, he had a great start to his career here in Winnipeg. He was I like mean, half he and played. he was half and half. Come on, he played. Was I mean, it? I would have guessed, I would have guessed just off the top of my head, it would have been like maybe 30% if that in Winnipeg. Okay. He played 551 games for the Coyotes. Mm-hmm. And then he played, hold on. You can do some quick math here on the, uh, and then he played 547 games in Winnipeg. So oh, that is 50-50. That's, and then he played, you know, a couple of years, uh, one year in Dallas and then four years Buffalo. In, in Buffalo. So, I mean, he was basically split. How many, ga- how many NHL games did he play? 1,400? 1,372 over oh, 20 wow. years. Well, he, uh, at, listen, I, I'm so pumped. I mean, as uh, I think one bird dropped in the chat, anyone that remembers Jets 1.0, remember the signs that the booster clubs made? There was Kite's Corner. The best one maybe was Newman sets the Teppo. Still to this day, if you are of a certain vintage and you mention Teppo Newman to a Jet fan, they will reply to you with, oh, Newman sets the Teppo, of course. Um, uh, great memories of old days and what an incredible player that he was and Obviously, Timu Solani goes without saying. Um, Listen, we'll talk a little bit more about this, and we'll certainly get to this with Jeff, and I think we'll kind of re-go back to it in about 20 minutes when all this um, uh, is official. Uh, And we'll certainly be hitting with the latest news in the Canadian Football League, but um, with a hammer. Um, But Remo, really sad news about Andrew Harris coming over the wire today. Yeah, uh, Dave Naylor reporting that he's going to be out for the season after having surgery. And we talked yesterday how he was out, what, like four to six weeks with, uh, I think it was pec injury. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, torn pec muscle requires season-ending surgery. So 
I mean, that's a big blow for the Argos, who signed him in the offseason. He's been great. We saw him in the game against the Bombers, and that's rough. I mean, you want to come back after having a you know an injury plague season last year, and again, uh, four to six weeks torn pec. Uh, tough for the Argos. Uh, while, you know, if we're playing fantasy, uh, Wallet is going to be pretty cheap uh, on the DraftKings. I'm sure on the CFL one too, but he'll fill in and. I mean, that's just a, a tough break for Andrew Harris. Yeah, I mean, listen, I guess there are some CFL DFS guys that will care about who's next up after Andrew Harris. But as far as Winnipeg sports fans, um, they're caring about Andrew Harris. And this could very well be the end of the road for, I mean, a, a surefire first ballot straight to the Hall of Fame career um, that, you know, started in B.C., continued through with the championship era here in Winnipeg. And we talked yesterday about how important he was in turning this thing around. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion throughout this season as to, you know, the decision that the Bombers made moving on from Andrew uh, and moving on to the younger uh, running backs. Certainly that decision's looked a lot better in the last month or so with Brady Oliveira really sort of, you know, hitting his stride, shall we say, and having some big, big games. Um, But, I mean, the impact of Andrew Harris is going to be felt here for a long, long time. And um, it is going to be really weird. I mean, this is Andrew's home. I have no idea about what his situation is. I mean, how long he was planning on staying in Toronto, what the living situation is. If, you know, being under contract, he's out for the season. So, I mean, do you rehab there or do you just come back? Um, It will be bizarre if it does come to it to have Andrew back home, see him around while the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are pushing for another championship. But um, listen, all I can hope is that he um, heals well, and if he doesn't want to give it another go next season, there's an opportunity for him. But um, Troy Westwood always said he was never going to retire, and maybe Harris is that sort of a guy too, where if there's an opportunity, he's out there. If not, he just won't be playing. Uh, But anyway, it was really sad news, and we heard that the best-case scenario would he would be out around six weeks, Uh, But there was the potential that it was season ending. And um, that's a big, big blow to a legendary athlete for our team and our community. And um, certainly for the CFL as a whole. I mean, the bottom line, Michael, is that the Canadian Football League is better when Andrew Harris is getting the rock and uh, moving the chains. Yeah, of course. Absolute CFL legend, uh, Hall of Famer. And uh, I mean, that's tough to see. You wish him all the best going to Toronto. And here he is with the torn peck. We are reminded, uh, torn, if you want to know what a torn peck looks like, look back to Cody Rhodes in the Hell in a Cell match <laughs> earlier this year. That I was guess, brutal. I guess Andrew Harris didn't want to didn't want to gut it out with the torn torn peck like Cody Rhodes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit more than that one match. Here's, here's the picture. Hold on. Do you have the picture of Cody from the Hell in a Cell? Like yeah. It was, yeah. and again for podcast listeners, you'll uh, have to check the YouTube, but. That's the most disgusting bruise I think I've yeah, ever seen in my life. Looks horrible. So I'm assuming just, and, the look on his face in that picture just shows how much pain did he was in. Uh, and you all say that wrestling is fake. Get the hell out of here. Yeah. Uh, I, w- I bet you Andrew uh, Harris could get some good, you know, Instagram likes if he did. Who who wore it better? My torn peck versus <laughs> Cody Rhodes torn peck. If you want to get likes, I think that would be a good way to get likes. I don't know. Uh, well, um, anyways, uh, just thoughts for, for Harris and, um, I'll tell you what, I was sort of pulling for the Argos this year because he was there. I mean, I've not no skin in the game for any teams in the East. And, and I did think, I mean, it would have been an incredible story if the Bombers made it to the Grey Cup and it was the Argos on the other side. Because, of course, Toronto wasn't coming here this year. I mean, that was one of the real disappointing things about the Bombers' schedule was that, Andrew Harris wasn't going to be given the homecoming that he deserved, you know, in a visitor jersey. They were just playing the one game this season. Luckily, it happened earlier this year before this injury happened. Um, But there was always that potential of meeting in Regina for the Grey Cup and the Bombers looking for a three-peat. But um, that will not happen right now. Andrew Harris out for the year, which is a... uh, which is a really, really sad, uh, sad story. Anyways, we'll move on with that. We'll touch on that a little bit with Jeff Hamilton, of course, who has covered Andrew throughout uh, throughout his career. Hammer's going to jump on a little bit later on. Uh, but Reem, you know, I- I've still been thinking about, uh, now that we've had a little bit more time to digest what Mark Shifley had to say um, it, and, you know, talk with different people, it was very interesting 
seeing both the comments on the YouTube page yesterday uh, and conversations with other Jet fans about how the very, and I mean, I guess this is just part of the uh, part of the job, but the differing opinions on what people heard from Mark Shifley. Um, you had some people that were um, probably on board from the get-go and, you know, completely buying the blame the media excuse that, you know, caused the kerfuffle in the first place. Um, and then you had some other people that, you know, appreciated the tone of it, but thought that it lacked, you know, much accountability. And I mean, as I said, I don't, you know, I don't know if we really need to relitigate last season as far as what happened, because I mean, uh, it stunk for everybody involved uh, and you're certainly hoping for a much better atmosphere and attitude around it. Um, but as far as kind of coming in, like, I don't know how much this entirely settled other than it certainly showed that Mark's got a smile on his face. He's looking forward to the upcoming season. And maybe in reality, that's the only thing that counts. Although for a team where we talked so much about a lack of accountability, um, you certainly want to see that next year when we get to it about playing and, uh, you know, maybe just putting it all on the media wasn't uh, wasn't exactly a great example of that. Uh, I, what have you been hearing from people, and what did we hear on the YouTube channel? Yeah, someone messaged me yesterday, or I said, "Hey, Mark Shifley did this video with Sarah. You guys want to check it out?" And they're like, "What's his excuse for the comments?" I was like, "Well, he blamed the media for blowing it out of <laughs> proportion." And you know, I I think it looked like a different Mark Shifley than it was. At the end of the season, he that was happy. the most important thing to me. He, he seemed ready to go. I don't care, care that you know he blamed the media for taking his comments out of out of context. If you believe that or not, he seems ready to play. He seems like he wants to win. Uh, he likes it. You know, he said, "Hey, the first thing I said was that I like Winnipeg." He just, you know, he said that, but after it, and um, we did get one comment here on YouTube, and I do love, um, you know, I read all the YouTube comments. It's nice to respond. And uh, the Colt says with us, says to us, he goes, with all due respect to you guys, you, the media, totally blew this 1,000% out of proportion. That's just about all you talked about till Dubois dropped his news about not signing long term. In fairness, that's your job, but you'll never admit to fanning the flames about him wanting out and getting traded with like three or four exclamation marks. I never got that from his exit interview, and I've been rock solid from the second the interview ended, saying, arguing with anyone and everyone that Shafley was going nowhere, and he is not the locker room cancer like some have theorized. It's all good. I'm still a fan of the show and still watch and love you guys. I'm just calling it as I see it. The Thank cult. you. Thank hell you, of a, the cult. Hell of a comment. Hell of a comment. And yes. listen, I will say this, uh, this about that. Um, it is funny. I mean, I guess we technically are sort of part of the media. I mean, I think what we do here on this show every day is very different to what, you know, uh, Free Press or The Sun or TSN. I mean, you know, we've got a little bit more freedom here. Um, you know, it certainly is a much more grounded grassroots level show. I mean, I think that, you know, our, our, our YouTube chat and the comments and the, the uh, interaction we have with, you know, the listeners and Winnipeg fans, I think sets it apart a little differently. And I think most people that know me and regulars know me. I mean, I don't think of really ever have ever thought of myself as a quote unquote media guy. I always thought of myself as a Winnipeg guy. I'm more a fan first, you know, that has been able to sort of carve a unique space in the, uh, you know, and now I guess basically in the internet, but before even with TSN 1290, um, that, you know, to have these sort of conversations, uh, but have a different perspective than the big J journos, if you will. I will be the first one to admit, I saw what Mark Shifley said, and, and I think maybe probably more than, you know, a typical media person, I reacted more to it because it, like many fans, it sort of set me off. I mean, we talked so much about accountability and what had happened with this club, and we'd heard the right things from so many players, and Shifley really did come across as a guy that was looking around the room at everybody except himself. Um, and obviously for one of your leaders to do that after the season that he'd had, I thought it was a terrible look. Trust me on this one. This was not just me. It certainly wasn't the media, and it certainly wasn't the majority of fans. I, I think this immediately set off people 
throughout True North in the Winnipeg Jets organization for a guy that the organization had done so much for before. So, I mean, I think that's why the reaction was what it was. It sure as hell wasn't created by the media. I think we can all sort of laugh at that. But moving forward, this is, I mean, they're playing the PR game right now. And I think it is important, whether you kind of laugh it off or kind of roll your eyes to it, realize that the most important thing going forward is having, is being bought in, is, you know, it just needs to be sincere with the fact that he committed to moving forward with the Winnipeg Jets and happy to be here. Um, because as I said yesterday, when we talked with Mike, uh, you know, anyone else that did this, it would sort of be, uh, you know, people would probably handle it differently. But Mark Scheifele has been so important to this team and has really been a guy that at the the best point of Jets 2.0 was the guy putting the team on his back and, you know, through the Nashville series, I mean, taking them to the conference finals. Now, you know, things change, people grow, people mature, people change, and um, you know, Mark's obviously very different than the wide-eyed kid that came here as an 18-year-old and, uh, and the first ever draft pick of the Winnipeg Jets. But make no mistake about it, if Mark Scheifele's on this team, he's one of the most important players. Rick Bonus, number one job, I would say, well, maybe number one, one of many things is to make sure that Mark is engaged, feeling positive, and, do, and, and being the best player that he can be. Scheifele said he's in the prime of his career. Well, guess what? Let's see it this year uh, because I don't think we saw it for a majority of last season. And if that's the case, then we're talking about a team that, you know, probably looks a little bit different than it did last year. Bottom line from my perspective is, regardless of how things are taken in the media or even with fans, Mark Scheifele, th- a lot of things were broken with this team this year. That's not made up. Um, but Scheif, maybe more than any player right now, can be the leader and can be the change um, that can have a massive, massive impact on what this team's able to do next season. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. You need the guys bought in. He seemed excited. We talked about this yesterday. He seemed excited about the new coaching staff, what they're going to do, do some things differently. I think it'll be good to have a fresh start. Um, the, you, know, you are concerned again. We haven't replaced. They haven't replaced um, Cop and Stasny, so we'll wait and see about that. But I, I do think we'll see a better Mark Shifley. Pierre Luc Dubois, you know, he's wants to get that big contract. He's going to be bringing it as well, and we'll see about player usage and how the, how that goes. And you know, maybe the defense will be improved. I don't know. We'll see some. I think we'll see some more moves as the season goes on. But again, it is August seventeen. Countdown, countdown to uh, the young stars. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. The, the young stars. I, I love the fact that you keep on bringing up the you young bring stars. You got to bring it up. Yeah. What do you mean? That's like <laughs> that's signals. Like start a hockey season, right? Uh, I guess I would think more the opening of training camp. I mean, uh, young stars. It's like the young... pre-training camp. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, well, what about the Manitoba Open? What about a jet playing in the Manitoba Open? Oh, oh. The, that is happening tomorrow. That, that leads into it. And, uh, yeah, of course, Manitoba Open is getting going tomorrow out at Southwood. Mark Shifley is playing. We'll get you the tee times later on if people want to go out and check it out. And we're hoping to have the head of PGA Tour Canada come on the program, talk a little bit about the event, about the tour this year, and about the sort of boost that you get from having a guy like Mark Shifley play in the tournament. Um, he has been in it once before. I know he'll be ready to go, knowing what is what the challenges of that golf course are, which I'm sure he knows very well, uh, but also what it's like playing with the pros and um, hopefully it'll be a great story for uh, golf in the province and certainly for the Winnipeg Jets I, as well. I will say this about Manitoba Open. You know, you look at the tournament here a couple of years ago and how many players that played here are now on the PGA Tour. I know mm-hmm. you talked about it yesterday with Mike, but I remember, I think we had on like Brian Munns like, Played in a thing with uh, who JJ Spawn, who's on tour. Yeah, I always see, I always see guys on the tour. I'm like, oh, they played, they played here. Uh, so I'm, you know, it's a good oh, look at my guy Tony Fina. Tony Fina. Fina. I mean, we're Team Tony here. This is a Tony show, uh, as well as all the Canadians, and we'll talk about with Z-Man later on. But I mean, part of the reason, if people are wondering, like, why the hell does Huss love Fina so much? I mean, hey, he's a hell of a golfer and one of the nicest guys. I mean, he is a great athlete that you'd want your kids to emulate. But he played here in Winnipeg, and he made it to the PGA Tour, and he was the first guy ever of a PGA Tour player to come on the warm-up back in the day. 
and talk about his experience in PGA Tour Canada and how that helped him get to the next level. So um, there'll be some great players in this event this week that we'll be hearing from and will be more household names later on down the road than they are right now. If you're a golf fan, I certainly suggest you you check it out. And just speaking of with it being at, at Southwood, let's take a quick look at what the weather's going to be like over the course of the next few days. Uh, tomorrow, it sounds like there's going to be some showers with the risk of a thunderstorm and then sunny 26, 25, mix of sun and cloud. The big question is the wind. Because anyone that's been to the new Southwood after they've moved from uh, the U of M location will know that that is two entirely different golf courses depending on the wind. Um, if it is completely still, uh, I mean, still an incredibly challenged course, beautiful greens, um, but you know, you're able to kind of pick your spots and go at it. There are zero trees on the entire golf course. When it starts blowing, it is an absolute beast. And, uh, you know, depending on the morning, afternoon runs, depending on what the weather's like, there could be some advent uh, advantages on one side or the other. Uh, but it certainly will be very interesting to see what happens. And we'll be on that tomorrow. And as I said, we will talk a little golf. There's so many big stories in the world of golf with Liv, Tiger and the PGA players meeting yesterday, the Patrick Reed lawsuit, the BMW championship. We'll hit some of that later on in the program after Jeff Hamilton joins us with the Z-man himself, Mark Zacchino from Golf Talk Canada. Yeah, so it's 127 now, Hustler. Perfect, th AKA 1327, meaning the time the Jets tweeted out today. Uh, I'm here refreshing the page. I don't know, did they not schedule it properly or? Where's the announcement? Uh, maybe, they're, they're late. Maybe. Oh, here it is. There oh, it is. is. There it is. This November, we honor two of the best who ever lace them up in Winnipeg. Is oh. there is there volume on that thing? Yeah, let me uh, get the volume. You want to hear Let's the volume? Play it. World premiere of the Jets tweet announcing the two newest inductees into the Jets Hall of Fame. And uh, these will be two of the most popular inductees I think uh, this city could possibly be welcoming into the rafters at the arena. Yeah, one sec, let me get the sound on here. My, bu my button stopped working. Ah, these technical difficulties. Solani and Newmanen, two of the greatest Finns. I would say this, they're right up there with the best Finnish players in NHL history and certainly cornerstones of Jets 1.0. So uh, Solani and Newmanen going into it. Now, we actually have some other good Jet stuff to talk about, but um, before we do that, Hammer's coming up in a few minutes. Uh, Got to give a shout out to our friends at Wallace & Wallace. Great support of Bark in the Park on the weekend. And uh, hey, they're not only the fencing specialists in the city, but they also work with Clope, the largest garage door manufacturer in the world. And right now, despite supply chain issues, you can still get a beautiful new garage door delivered and installed within four weeks, just in time for the chaos of what's to come after Labor Day with back to school hockey and everything you've got going on for you and your family. And uh, by the way, new door can also add up to 4% to the value of your home on the garage, of course. 161 styles of garage doors to choose from. There is definitely a style that's right for your home. Visit them at wallacedoors.com. Give them a call or visit their showroom on Lawson Road. I'm so fired up. I just got an email from the fellas at F Apparel. I went in, got some shirts and a suit ready to go for fall. I got a wedding on the long weekend, and um, it's ready for me to go. Now, I probably won't live stream trying it on, but you know we'll get to another milestone soon. We'll be doing another suit day, and uh, I will be ready to go with my new look from F Apparel. If you need to up your game when it comes to the clothing and style fashion, men, get on down to 190 Smith Street downtown. 
The process was amazing. Andrew and his staff took great care of me. They measure you out. Bottom line is they want something that looks great for you and fits great. And uh, it's tailor-made to order. Uh, also, guys, if you've got a wedding party or wedding coming up, 15% off for the entire wedding party when you get your suits at F Apparel. And there's still time to take advantage of that. Three shirts for $210 special right now down at F. If you can't make it downtown, check them out online or make an appointment at app. That's ephapparel.com. And uh, tell you what, our friends at Vita Health have had one heck of a summer. Um, and everyone has. I mean, listen, the weather didn't start out too great, but it sure has been nice for the most part the last little while. And we're maxing out every day we can. I'm heading to the ballpark tonight, but I know many of you are having barbecues and Vita Health and amazing spots to stop by. I mean, obviously you got burgers, dogs, all that stuff, but they also have lean bison steaks, bison burgers, chicken. I mean, basically Vita Health is stocked with Winnipeg's best selection of local, organic, and natural groceries, not to mention supplements and beauty products, all at great prices. They've also got a wicked grab-and-go deli, soups, sandwiches, salads, healthy and ready to go for you at any of the seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge and online at myvita.ca. Again, I'm still buzzing from the great time uh, we had out at Aikens Lake a couple of weeks ago. I saw a monster, monster master angler while I come out on their socials. Make sure to give Pitt Turan a call at Aikens Lake. If you're thinking about a uh, friends and family trip or maybe an incredible corporate getaway, find out more at AikensLake.com on uh, maybe making a booking for next year. Speaking of fishing, uh, Reem, looked like some of the bombers got together and went out to, I think, Crowduck yesterday and uh, slamming some walleyes, taking advantage of the, uh, of the bomber bye week. Yeah, I mean, the Bombers on the bye, I'm enjoying um, seeing what they've been up to. The, you know, we don't have a game this week, but the Blue Bombers social media team. Um, they don't sleep. Do, they don't sleep. Yeah, they're doing a good job. So here's Winston Rose posting some pictures yesterday. I'll bring them up here. Look at this. It reminds me of <laughs> that, them. Like, that's holding... my favorite one. Double header for Winston, who has so much swag. There's Jackson Jeffcoat in the back right. I believe that's Les Morrow on the left. I'm not sure who's holding the fish as if he's about to put it into his mouth, but uh, it seems like the fellas had a few boats out on the water and certainly uh, had an Aikens-like performance of uh, slamming a whole bunch of beauties into the boat. Yeah, Jackson Jeffcoat tweeting that he's like love fishing and going out here. I, you know, I like seeing these guys enjoying the province. Um, hanging out. Les Morrow has been tweeting out like, where are some good beaches I can go to that are close to you Winnipeg? Four million responses from yep. everyone. But hey, get back, get put that back up because we need to go back. This was sort of a lead in to the other big story coming out of the Bombers today. Uh, just go back to the feed because right below that, oh. you will see the announcement today by the Bombers. There it is. The Banjo Bowl is sold out. Uh, it is always the game of the year. Although I'll say this, considering the Calgary game um, that happened earlier this year, the bar has been raised very high for both crowds and incredible excitement on the field. Uh, but we, we know full well, I mean, CFL is about Labor Day weekend and the rematch here in Winnipeg. And the fact that this game is sold out in mid-August just goes to show how far this team has come right now. The excitement for the home team, first and foremost, and the fact that um, the rivalry is back on at a huge, huge opportunity uh, to uh, see the Bombers continue their quest for first place in the West. And this is going to be a real challenge. Riders have back-to-back -back games against BC and then back-to-back -back games against the Bombers after that big win against Edmonton last week. It's almost like has, there's two Banjo Bulls this year. Is there not? You have the game Saturday, September 10. But then, you know, a couple weeks later on September, Friday, September 30, uh, you got a home game on a Friday against the Riders. So I wonder how that second game will do. But the Banjo Bowl is always packed house. Great, you know, one of the last weekends you can count on with, you know, good, pretty good weather. You know, schools just uh, starting out, and um, you have the riders in town. I'm, you know, looking forward to see seeing the crowd for this game. You know, it's going to be everyone's going to be into it Saturday afternoon. We know who to thank for getting the banjo bowl on Saturday. 
instead as, of Sunday. Am I right? It was one of the great campaigns we ever orchestrated back in the day. And I, I'll say this of Bombers, and I give Wade Miller all the credit for this. This is a guy that listens to fans. He has a lot of common sense. He, I, I think for a long time in the Bomber organization, and a lot of organizations, frankly, not just there, people will give a million reasons why they can't do something. Wade's a guy that has always said, no, how do we do this? And um, I think it was pretty clear. I mean, the the logic that I banged over and over again for a couple of years on TSN was that, you know, the Labor Day game, we do these trips, we go out there, we pack buses, we have an amazing time in Regina, you have the game, and then you've got a day off to travel and get your wits about you before you have to show up and, you know, earn a paycheck the next day. To have the Banjo Bowl on the Sunday of a non-long weekend Never mind that it was the first week of NFL, which made absolutely no sense to go up against. Um, you know, it just made too much sense. And since they made that change, the Banjo Bowl has gone up, up, and well, to the point where it's now selling out a month before the game. So anyways, great work to the Bombers, the, their ticketing staff, Carol and the gang that uh, do so much behind the scenes. Buckle up, everybody. If you don't have a ticket already, now's the time to try to scrounge and find somebody that does. And um, and you did make the point, Remo, that there is a third game between the Riders later on in September. Certainly that won't be like the Banjo Bowl. Hey, hopefully it is. Hopefully they can sell that one out as well and you can do it twice. Um, I always loved when there is a third game based on the schedule. I mean, you know the Bombers are playing, uh, Riders playing Labor Day and the week after for the Banjo Bowl. I loved it was a few years ago when the Bombers and Riders opened the season as well. I believe, well, the Bombers have the first win of everything. They've got the first uh, regular season win at Mosaic Field. I believe they've got the first playoff win at Mosaic Field. And wouldn't be something if they rounded it out with the first Grey Cup win at Mosaic Field coming up a little later on. But uh, we'll worry about the end of September first. Bombers got a couple games before then. A week Thursday against Calgary is when they are back. We'll be packing that Princess Auto tailgate party before the game. And um, as I said, I'm I'm missing the Bombers this week because we've had so much fun talking about their games and nine out of ten times big wins this year. Um, it's going to be uh, be a little different. Glad we got a golf tournament and Mark Shifley showed up to talk yesterday to give us a, a little bit more to talk about before, of course, we get to the big game next week. Uh, this has been great, Huss. Uh, the You're Mark muted. Shifley. One sec. You're muted, Remus. Well, I'm muted for you. I'm muted for you, not for the stream. There, oh, now okay. you can hear me. We're good. There you it. go. I had. Like, it, it, I am an important person to be able to hear you. Yeah. Uh, I had a slight issue uh, issue during that, so I'm glad he took a while to talk. Um, you know, we we had the Shifley news yesterday. We have this Jets Hall of Fame announcement today. Very exciting. People just tuning in, saying, "Hey, you haven't talked about it." Salani and uh, Tepo Newman being honored in November. I'm sure there'll be a pregame ceremony. I wonder what game it's going to be. Actually, are they playing? The, I would think are they playing the Coyotes then, or the or the Ducks? Like what? What team would be? They haven't. We haven't had too much detail. And then we did get a picture yesterday um, about the Dale Howardchuck statue that's going to be unveiled in October. And I love yes. this. I love this honoring of past Jets 1.0 and you know, maybe even 2.0 if we get a Dustin Bufflin night. In the future, or I saw Andre Pavlik is coaching Czechia. I mean, he's a Jets 1.0, 1.0 legend. It's been 10 years, so but I love the honoring of the history. Um, and I know there's gonna be people out there like, well, it's not the same franchise. Well, they played in the in the city. I mean, come, yeah, come on, yeah, like let's, you're let's the get one, real. Here. You're the one that says that. Although you actually no. say that, and then you say that it's ridiculous, but nobody well, cares no, anymore. I, this I, is Winnipeg I'm, Jets history. Yes, Winnipeg Jets history. I agree. I think that should definitely be honored. However, I will add that it, it seems silly. It seems silly that Solani is not the record holder. Like, we're honoring him for his time with the Winnipeg Jets, but he's not uh, the record what holder. What happened? Hold on. Sec. Sorry, I'm having some issues here. Screwing around. I'll edit this out. Okay, you can All hear right. me now? We back? Yeah, we're back. We're back. I was going to say, we've had some issues, you know... I lost my whole train of thought now. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, it's silly, Huss, that Solani the record, is not the record holder for the Jets' rookie gold record. That's it. 
Oh yeah, that I, again. You're just gonna trigger me and trigger a bunch of we people don't need to, in the chat. We don't need to focus on the negative. About that. Let's focus on the positive. T Tepo, I'm just so happy that Tepo is part of this as well, um, and they're doing it together. Uh, what a cool, cool event that'll be! Um, just some amazing Finnish connection with the team. The one thing that is really sad is that this is happening and Patrick Line is no longer a member of the Winnipeg Jets because um, that would be, if you had, if Line was still here doing that for Newman and Ancelani, I mean, I think it even more so would really entrench the Jets as a team for a long time that was probably the team in Finland because of the great stars here. One more thing about the Banjo Bowl, by the way, and I've seen a number of people mention it. Um, that is also going to be the Sarah Orleski farewell game on TSN. Um, you know, as Sarah mentioned yesterday, after uh, the Jets uh, announced her hiring and they released the interview that she did with Scheif, um, she is finishing up with a couple more games. And that final game, the final farewell for an incredible TSN career is going to be at the Banjo Bowl. So uh, very appropriate that Sarah will get that send off in front of the biggest game of the season in the regular season, as it were, here in Winnipeg in a packed IGF. Yes, uh, I agree with you. I'm sure there'll be a big ovation from the crowd last time on the CFL sidelines. Um, so we'll see. And I'll go with the, uh, hey, I'm just going to add this in. The Jets play the Ducks at home. On November 17th. So if I had to put betting odds, which game this would be on the Jets, that's a Thursday night. I wonder if it'll be be that one. Oh, that'd be nice. That'd be nice. Yeah. Maul asking, why do Jets fans hate Atlanta? I don't hate so much? it. I don't do hate they hate Atlanta? Atlanta? I, I mean, like Atlanta's Atlanta is just sort of insignificant. I mean, they kind of don't matter. There's a lot of people that can't stand Phoenix because, of course, the Jets went to Phoenix and then there's this whole business with the records. But I mean, listen, I'm, I love Atlanta. Thank, thank God for them because if they weren't there, we're probably not talking about the Jets in all likelihood not doing this right now. Um, so uh, I certainly have that. That being said, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of people that would be looking for like a Thrasher's throwback jersey or something like that. Um, you know, I think considering the history that we lost when the team left, uh, I would have a feeling that um, we're probably talking about a, 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 a fan base. And I'm just speak for myself that, you know, would like more, of exactly what they're doing, connecting with the Winnipeg history, yeah. as opposed to, uh, as opposed to you know Rich Peverly and uh, everything that happened with the Atlanta Thrashers. Yeah, I I don't hate Atlanta at all. I'm just uh, indifferent to it. And you had you know history here. It's like the Manitoba Moose. Like you look at how the AHL does history, or the other leagues do history. Um, you know, it's with it's with the city that it happened in. So it just seems weird that it just. Seems weird when, you know, we're going to be like, oh, yeah, Winnipeg Jets 1.0, 1.0. And then you have these records that are in, in Phoenix. But, I mean, it's I'll fine. say this. Maul makes what? a good point, though. Maul makes a good point that, though, for, you know, for something different and something neat, a retro reverse Thrasher's jersey. He said retro reverse Thrasher's jersey would be money. Uh, that would be something that they could probably sell a lot of, maybe not necessarily in this market. Uh, but it would be something that I think it, would be sort of neat. Okay, give me that Thrasher's third jersey that had the, like, teal along the arm and said, like, Thrasher's on. I'll pull it up right now. That, and <laughs> give me a Jets version of that. Sure, why why not? Uh, it was, all right. Yeah, you find that. Oh, yeah, we'll hit one. that up later on after uh, after uh, ha Hammer comes on with us uh, because Jeff Hamilton is pretty much ready to go. Um, geez, I got my Vita Health... Uh, Water bottle filled with the good stuff from Culligan, folks. Uh, hydration break. Well, we usually do that before Ken comes on because he's always guzzling water. Um, but that's probably a good thing. We all need it. And uh, Culligan has been supplying water and water services to Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba for 65 years. Softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, drinking water systems, citywide water delivery services, and commercial and industrial water products and solutions. They've got it all for you, whether it's for the home, the cottage, or the office. 694 5180, 1200 Sergeant Avenue, or check them out online at drinkculligan.com. If you've got water needs, they have you covered. Well, speaking of jerseys, we were just talking about retro reverse and all the different ones. You want jerseys? You go to Royal Sports, uh, probably the best store. 
anywhere when it comes to your favorite team. Of course, the Winnipeg Jets and Winnipeg Blue Bombers, well represented there with thousands of pieces of merchandise for our local teams. Uh, But NHL, NBA, Major League Baseball, and tons of new NFL gear coming in by the day, getting ready for NFL kickoff next month. Royal Sports is the spot. Of course, they're also the hockey superstore, but still some great stuff for the little bit of summer we have left. Bikes, soccer, baseball, um, uh, softball as well, not to mention tennis, disc golf, fitness stuff, and more. They have it all. Pop by and see them. Tell them your boys at Winnipeg Sports Talk sent you 750 Pemina Highway and follow them on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. Um, we did talk a little golf earlier today. Mark Zacchino is going to join us later on, but a big shout out to our friends at Breezy Ben for their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. BMW Championship gets in going tomorrow for the second final round, final tournament of the year. Top 30 will move on to the Tour Championship in Atlanta. If you're thinking about a new golfing home for your family, talk to Corey Johnson over at Breezy Bend about joining one of Winnipeg's private, uh, best private courses, getting on the waiting list for next year. And you can check them out online at breezybend.ca for everything that they've got for you. And hey, a big thank you to our friends at Not Auto Corp. Now, uh, I'm thinking Banjo Ball. I've been to a number of games with the Not Gang. I know they are going to be ready big time for the Banjo Bowl. But of course, the Banjo Bowl is also a sort of the turning of the seasons getting into fall. And if you need a new whip for the upcoming fall and winter, before you do anything, go see the gang down at Not Auto Corp for the best selection and best prices on pre-owned vehicles. Many luxuries and many Teslas as well. If you're thinking about going electric, talk to the Knot experts. Why not get into the car of your dreams at an amazing price with the help of the Knot team? They are at Waverly and McGilvery, and you can also check them out online at knot.ca. All right, Z-Man Mark Sacchino coming up a little later on. Oh, and we do have information for the sports trivia night. I'll be hosting at Little Brown Jug on the 1st of September. We'll get to that a little later on. But right now, let's welcome in Jeff Hamilton from the Winnipeg Free Press for his weekly visit. Hammer, what's going on? How are you? Not too bad, man. Good to be here. A couple days later, but I uh, got, got an opportunity to practice in the mirror ahead of this hit. So let's get her done. Well, you look like a million U.S. tax free as always. <laughs> uh, great to have you on the program. Hey, listen, I want to talk some jet stuff with you, um, which we will do in a moment. But... You've covered Andrew Harris for a real long time. Um, real sad news. I and mean, we knew that he was going to be out for a bit, but um, season ending surgery on this torn pack for Andrew Harris. Uh, what does this mean for him going forward? I mean, is there a chance that this is going to be the final chapter of Harris as a CFL running back? Or, I mean, you know, I'm quite well. I mean, the motor in that guy is um, unparalleled. And the fact of the matter was he was still playing at a very, very high level this year. I mean, now, uh, what do you think's next for 33? Yeah, if I've learned anything about Andrew uh, from covering him over the years, it's really not to uh, to count him out on anything. Yes. And if, 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 if you take into consideration, you know, his his desire or his motivation to return to the CFL this year after, you know, winning back-to-back championships, after, you know, having twice the opportunity to kind of ride off into the sunset, um, he specifically noted that it was because he – he didn't like the way his year played out in 2021. Obviously not the result. The result is exactly what he would have wanted. It was his injury history. And, and you know, it was a point of pride for him not to end his career on an injury-riddled campaign. So if you take that logic into play, um, you know, you'd think that he'd be, you know, I don't know if it's chomping at the bit, but would be interested in, in – you know, having this season not be his last one, not only, you know, is it a year outside of Winnipeg, um, but to have it, you know, have it cut short at the midway mark of the season. So, I mean, understanding, I, you know, I can't predict, you know, his future nor anybody else's, not even my own, actually. Um, You know, I I would tend to think that this may be a motivator at the same time, you know, being 30, you know, in his mid thirties now, you know, any injury, particularly one that, you know, eliminates a season is going to be tough to come back from, to rehab from. Uh, again, I think the motivation is certainly there. It will be the desire. Um, you know, I don't think he'll, you know, I don't think Andrew will want to end his career on something like this, an injury like this. 
Um, but at the same time, there's no guaranteeing that next season something wouldn't happen, right? I mean, he's getting up there in age, of course, and uh, he plays a, he plays a very physical game. So as much as it is uh, as disheartening it is for him and, and for all CFL viewers to, to not be able to watch him the remainder of the season, I don't want to say it's equally as predictable, but this was one of the concerns for him heading into the season, both by the Bombers and anybody who would have signed him, um, that he probably weren't going to get an 18-game season. Now, I'll end it with this. I don't think anyone expected it to be an eight- or nine-game season either. So certainly disappointing, but uh, we'll see what the future has to hold, and I wouldn't rule out 33 for anything moving into well, the uh, next season. And- and it certainly uh, shows you how much things can change over the course of a month. Um, you know, a month ago, we saw Harris looking like he was in peak form, doing exactly what we've become accustomed to see for over a decade in the Canadian Football League. And for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Brady Oliveira and Johnny Augustine, the running game was having a tough time coming close to, you know, the dominant running game that the Bombers had been known for for the last couple of years. That certainly is not the conversation around Bomberville this year, despite the loss last week. I mean, Brady has really hit his stride and seems to be playing with a new level of confidence and a new level of connection with the offensive line, who, albeit the line themselves, maybe didn't have one of their best games against Montreal. Zach Caleros was on the run quite a bit. The running game, far, far better than it was four or five games into the season. Yeah, I'm high. I was always high on Brady Oliveira, you know, even through his struggles. And this isn't a, an I told you so moment because I, I really do think there's, you know, more, you need to expect more from him going forward. I don't think you can just be content with, a, you know, a month's worth of, of quality games. Um, that being said, I mean, I was with, I was with the, those people, too, who were like, you know, watching Andrew do what he was doing through the first whatever, five, six, seven games and, you know, not connecting that he that he was the missing piece in the Bombers offense and, and not just production in the run game, but just kind of heart and soul and energy. And, you know, fast forward those weeks and and the Bombers figured it out. They did have playmakers. I mean, Dalton Schoen, you know, became, you know, one of those guys. Greg Ellingson, you know, before getting hurt, now that he's back, is one of those guys. Nick Dembski is having a great season. Now Brady Oliveira is catching up. And, you know, I think a lot of the emphasis, um, you know, lay on his feet and rightfully so. He's the guy carrying the rock. He's the guy who gets all the praise when the running game's you know, going strong as is the case right now but you know as, as much as it you know falls on him as much as anybody there were there were other areas of the of the bombers run game that um you know that was that was lacking too and, and it's not just the o-line which was our you know which was battered and is, has faced a few a couple different injuries to starters this year and has forced that front five to adjust to one another and get used to one another and and that was always going to take time and and the run game was probably going to be the last thing that was that was buzzing right i mean protecting zach is ultimately the number one one situation there the other part of it is is the the role of the receivers i'm not saying that the receivers have become drastically better blockers over the last little bit but you know you start looking at a guy like drew Wolitarski, and if you're going to judge his value to the team in in simply receptions and and touchdowns i think you'd be doing a disservice to 82 in the sense that he's the guy that often runs into the box and becomes that extra you know that extra blocker and is it is upfield um you know blocking for brady Oliveira, whoever's coming out of the backfield um one other thing i would say to that is is that if you look at if you look at what um if you look at the o-line specifically i saw these numbers so i'll give complete credit to to derek taylor who posted them today talked about and i saw him talking we talked about this earlier in the season how you know where 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 Oliveira was was getting contact was averaging in around one yard through the first whatever five games or so, and in the last five games that's doubled to two point something. So um, you know might not sound like a big like a big difference, but it certainly is when when you know when you're expected to to take contact and add yards. If you're getting one extra versus two, um, you're already getting a better average right there right right there. So you know a lot of things have come into play. Certainly you know what I I think what I've appreciated with Buck Pierce, particularly with the run game, is he hasn't abandoned it. We've seen a lot of teams in the past, even this season, when things aren't going earlier, if they don't get that spark in the run game early in a game, they just completely abandon it and then you become a bit of a one-dimensional team the bombers haven't done that and i'd add one more thing to it so i'm adding things on things i said i wouldn't is that the bombers you know were were were, were successful in the run even before Oliveira kind of you know started racking up the yards late in game so they were putting games away with the run which is probably as impressive of 
as anything because th those are the situations where both sides know exactly what you're doing so it's really it really does become you know even more of a physical battle in the trenches but uh you know i think you know i i never not that i never doubted that this that the run game wouldn't you know wouldn't turn around or that that i uh you know i guaranteed it or anything like that but i i just felt like with the group up front with with uh you know buck pierce handling the offense with brady still very much learning how to be a a, a starting running back he turned 25 i think yesterday or today one of those days um the 15th i don't know what day it is anymore but uh you know the fact that he's a young back that is his first year as a starter it was going to take time and um if you read the stories from the past week um whether it was conversations with the coaches that had motivated him or the fact that you know he, he did what a lot of nhlers do right is he, he shed a bunch of weight early in early into the year thinking that he'd come back faster and try to be a different player uh and then he put it all back on to become that punishing north south runner that we've expected from and we see and we saw from him last season so i think it, all those things you know added up have, have resulted in the bombers turnaround and and just becomes you know will, will continue to be a uh you know a big part of that attack and a big part of opening up things through the air as well hammer um I gave you a little break there, eh? Just you so, did. Just, that yeah, was you wonderful. You were adding for things a smoke on things. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. Uh, uh, we are for the first time this year talking about a team with uh, a tick in the loss column, and I've been thinking a lot about that game on Thursday. Amazing crowd. Everything about the game was awesome, with the exception of how it ended. Uh, if you're a Bomber fan, the. Like, Mark Leggio had a lot of pressure coming in in this season. And I thought, for the most part, he'd acquitted himself very, very well. He had a garbage second half against BC, but it didn't matter because the route was on. And he's missed a few extra points. But other than that, he'd been pretty solid kicking field goals. And then Thursday happened. Um, I mean, the fact that we're talking about should they have gone and punted, I mean, to me, that's a, a non-story. I mean, I guess it's major, uh, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking to say you should have done that. I mean, for a guy that had been, had missed two field goals all year on what was essentially a chip shot, I don't know what message that would have sent to him. Actually, punt it. We we don't trust you to kick it. You might hit the, hit the uprights. Um, yeah. That being said, it blew up on them, and then he missed another one in the overtime um, and they weren't able to lose the game. Considering last year, adding Castillo late in the game, late in the game, and the um, what he did to help the Bombers win the Grey Cup, um, I know we're just talking about like literally five minutes of an entire season. But um, how does this change, or if it does at all, Mark Leggio's situation with the Bombers, and how does he overcome that, especially with all this time to think about it going into the first bye week of the season? Yeah, you know, I, I, I tend to believe Mark Leggio uh, when he said after the game that, you know, he was going to flush this one, that it was, you know, two bad kicks and, and, and how, you know, I don't know if I necessarily believe that he moved on completely from the first one leading into the second one. Uh, however, I do think with the support of, of the, you know, the Bombers locker room, which is incredibly supportive, which certainly, you know, I imagine everyone, if not most, uh players, teammates came up to him, including the coaching staff and just, you know, told him not to worry about it, that things happen, that, it, you know, it's the response that matters, not, not, you know, in this case, the kicks, but uh, I really do as, and as I wrote in the CFL run, my rundown column uh, that was out today, you know, I, I, I do think he gets the benefit of the doubt to come back. I do think Mark Leggio will be, you know, the kicker uh, once they return to play Calgary next week. Um, but I just, you know, you ask about the leash or you talk about a leash. I think it's extremely short. Um, I do think that, you know, and this is not to beat up on someone who's in their, you know, second year in this league, uh, who is, is also like Brady Oliveira, young in his mid-20s. Um, but the reality is, is this is a win business. And, and you know, understanding and covering, you know, Mike O'Shea for, for the time that I have, I mean, he'll never say it publicly that, you know, he'll put his complete trust behind him. Um, I guess my thing is, is I don't know what Mark Leggio can do between now and playoffs. And this is understanding that we still have eight games to play this season can do to build that trust back so that when it's a winner take all game, that Mike O'Shea is going to feel comfortable having him take field goals. But look, you know, he was 18 for 20 heading into the game. You know, I, I, I'm with you. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. And 
leaning heavily on hindsight to suggest punting the ball through the end zone in that situation. Like you're a, you're back to back great cup champions. You're, you're, you're a nine and O team and you're going to ask your kicker to punt the ball on a routine 32 yard field goal. Like that's insulting to everybody, especially the kicker. And, and again, I understand people saying you just need one point. You just need that yada, yada. And you know, the other argument too, is that why don't you just field goal kick it as hard as you possibly can through the end zone so that if you miss the field goal, as we've seen in the past in history, you get the point and you secure the win anyways. I think Mark Leggio was trying to do exactly that. I mean, if you look at all his kicks, he's never shanked it like that before. And when you try to go out of your shoes, like I think Mark Leggio did, you tend to have those, you know, your whole process is off. I've talked to a few kickers and now no one can get into his mind and tell you exactly what he was thinking. But as soon as you start trying to want, you know, wanting to blast it or, or, or you know, go out again, go out of your shoes, your entire technique, technique and process goes out the window. And when that happens, it leads to what, what we saw as the worst possible scenario as a kick. I mean, that wasn't just, I mean, everyone thought at the beginning, at least I did, that it was blocked. No, it was just shanked heavily to the left. And so the other thing and important, I think, in that is that he had to come out of his shoes because it would have been about a 50. So if you add the 20 yard, yards into it, that's 52. You, you'd assume they would have a couple guys in the back, uh, in the back of the end zone who are, you know, taller. They're not going to put their smallest guys there. So you're going to have to clear that guy. You're probably looking at least at a 57 yarder. And guess what? Mark Leggio doesn't even get trotted out for a 54 yard. So the fact that he would have to do that to clear it, that just isn't in his range. So really it came down to executing an extra point, which if you look at the stats for Mark Leggio this year, he's also missed a few of those. He was worse on one point converts than he was on field goals. But at the end of the day, I mean, you need to be able to hit that kick every, you know, and, and I think what, what definitely works against them, which is kind of Dr. Obvious here is that it would have been one thing if he shanked the kick and they would have lost like, by a point, you know, as we saw a la David Cote earlier this season with Montreal against Toronto, um, but he did it twice in a game. And and while, you know, the stakes weren't at their highest and that it wasn't a playoff game, this was a big moment. This was to go 10-0. and 0. This was before the bye. 10-0, and 0, that would tie a franchise mark. There was a lot of pressure there. So I just don't know if you can depend on Mark Leggio to do – to do field goals. Now the good news for Mark Leggio, of course, is he's been an awesome punter. I mean, his punting has been tremendous this season. And so you're going to keep him on the roster, but I, you know, if you had to ask me what it's going to look like hanging into the playoffs this season, I think you're going to have Mark Leggio on the roster and whether it's Ali Matata or somebody else, you know, maybe they can get Sergio Castillo from Edmonton as they continue to be a tire fire and will be eliminated in the next few weeks. Uh, maybe that's an option, but this team, I believe, needs to find a kicker, needs to be that final piece of the puzzle because the margin for error in playoffs is so slim that this team can't afford to have somebody out there that's going to get nervous before a big kick. Hey, when when is the trade deadline? Good question. Like, it's like it, it, there's still a few weeks to go. I, the reason I ask is that, um, of course, we've had plenty of conversation on the air and off, and the name Castillo comes up all the time. I mean, the Elks are going absolutely nowhere this season. And we all know how that worked for the Bombers last year. I mean, I think Leggy will have plenty of opportunity over the next few games to kind of show that he is the guy. But it would seem like that would be a logical phone call for Kyle Walters to make the deadline if they felt they needed to go that way. Well, absolutely. Like I said, I mean, that's what they did last year. And it's and, and it's not to suggest that you have to completely you know, rule out a guy like Mark Leggio to be your field goal kicker in the future, but you're chasing history right now. I mean, you're, you're, you're chasing a third champion, third straight championship. You have the opportunity to cement yourself as, you know, as a dynasty, as we've thrown that word out over the last few months, as they've, they, as they've you know, went to, as, as they entered this season. And, and I mean, there's just, look, it's, it's not personal, it's business. And at the end of the day, you know, if, as much as I had mentioned, and I, and I wholeheartedly believe that, that Mark Leggio is getting a ton of support. I'm not 100% sure that support would be there if this was the West Final. 
or this would be something else. I think there'd be a lot of guys who were, who were pissed off about it. So, you know, I, I think at this point, maybe you do give them an opportunity to kind of bounce back. But even then, I just, I, I still don't know. And I'm not trying to, you know, again, I know there's people who want to support Mark Leggio and, you know, and, and all that stuff. And, you know, I'm not against that. Luckily for those people, I don't make the decisions. Uh, but I just can't picture a situation that's going to earn the trust of Mike O'Shea heading into what will be an incredibly, incredibly high stakes playoffs for this. Season. Yeah, a couple interesting uh, comments in the chat. Rob Summerville says, Huss, uh, Bombers losing at this time of the season is inconsequential given when it happened. Yes, it was a horrible way to lose a game, but I'd rather have it happen now instead of the Western final or the Grey Cup. Absolutely. But I guess the point, Rob, is if they feel that that is a possibility, if it's happened in the regular season, maybe you go a different way. But then Kevin Kowalik says, Castillo is hitting at a lower percentage than Legio. Is he actually an upgrade? And, you know, that is the thing about the kicking job. You can have a bad 10 minute period and it can really make everybody forget about a great half season that's already happened so far. Jeff Hamilton's with us from the Winnipeg Free Press. I want to get to Jets, but just one more thing before we go. The Jokers over at Three Down Nation now have the Bombers at number two in the power poll. Is this a complete overreaction to a loss that, frankly, should not have happened? Or is this just recognizing what Nathan Rourke and the British Columbia Lions are doing? I mean, it seems crazy to have a team, two teams with one loss, and the team that got smoked at home by the team being ahead of them. But... uh this team continues to turn heads, open eyes, and um, this is part of the reason why that game may not be inconsequential, to Rob Somerville's point, is that both of these teams have won. I think the Bombers are a shoe in for the Grey Cup if they win the West and have that game at home in November. I'm not so sure if it's another crack in BC later on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, I mean, are they crazy? No. I mean, I don't think they're crazy. I personally think the Bombers stay there. Uh, it's power rankings, though, right? So power <laughs> rankings aren't standings. They're just who's the hottest team hanging into the next week. And if you look at the Bombers, I mean, yeah, you can take all the things into consideration, like no bye weeks, that they were rested, that they're, you know, that they're, sorry, fatigued, that they're banged up, all those things, um, you know, on their side, sure. Uh, but BC marched back, you know, Nathan Rourke became what Nathan Rourke. And what, and what a, a game. game. And, like and beat a very... Great Calgary team. 240 in the air in the fourth quarter to come back against a good Calgary team. I mean, that was a legendary game. I, I can't say enough about Nathan Rourke. I'll be honest. I wasn't sold at all going into the season. I thought BC was frankly nuts to, you know, put all their eggs in all these other baskets and go in with two cheap young Canadian quarterbacks. They're looking like freaking geniuses right now because that's the difference, to be honest. When you look at the personnel elsewhere, I mean, take the Bombers out of it. They've sort of been become the bar that everyone else has measured. But when you look at the Calgary and BC, for instance, probably the next two best teams in the league, I mean, the difference in that game was the fact that, you know, they got that all-world performance from Nathan Rourke and still, because of the cap, had so much, much, much ability to add to a defense that really needed help and getting some playmakers for York to make plays. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at Nathan, I mean, you look at Peyton Logan returning that 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 punt or kickoff, or I forget what it was, now six and a half minutes left or so for a touchdown, and you kind of thought, okay, like, you know, Calgary's a good team, they're at home, you know, He's, you know, Nathan Rourke's a solid player and he's and he's been heating up this quarter, but there's no way that this guy is going to, you know, get it done. And then for to, for him to do what he did, for that, him to put them in a position for, you know, a relative chip shot for the victory, for him to just show a level of resilience that, you know, for a second year player, which I really, you know, I hope turns into giving guys more opportunity in their second year when you identify him. Obviously, Nathan Rourke wasn't just, you know, letting a second guy, a second year guy go. He obviously had shown signs that he was capable of it. And kudos to BC lions for, for doing it because I'm there with you. Haas. I, you know, I, I hate, I cringe for people to check the receipts, but while I definitely predicted Ottawa wouldn't be making the playoffs this season, while a lot of them had them topping the East, I also had the BC lions, I think last or second last, you know, with the, you know, with the theory that, running a, you know, a relatively young and inexperienced quarterback, one that, you know, teams would have had additional tape on, uh, you know, 
after last season as he came in for relief with Mike Riley for a fair amount of the year. I just didn't think this would happen. For him to be able to do that, for him to take the league by storm, for him to put up the numbers, you know, Nick Kowalski out in BC, you know, obviously a Winnipegger, you know, him talking about the, the projected numbers. Now there's still plenty of season to play, but he wouldn't just beat uh, Doug Flutie. He would crush his, <laughs> his, his top marks and that he would have 7,000 passing yards and 70 TDs. I don't think anyone's had 60 TDs and, you know, combined TDs and, and, and 6,000 passing yards. So for him to just even be in that conversation this late in the year, it's certainly great for the CFL. It's certainly great for the young man himself and the BC Lions who, you know, have had some, uh, had some tough years hanging into this season. And, and it really does make for what will be a fascinating, you know, down the stretch end of the season. The Bombers play the BC Lions in their last two games. There's a bye week separating those two games. So it's not the last two games of the season. Um, but it is the last two games for the Bombers. And, and what a series that would be, because I think a lot of people, my editors included, thought it would be probably a nothing game by the end of the year. Well, here you have BC, while they're, you know, while they're, they're still, a, they're still a few games, a couple games back in points, they have a couple games yet to play at seven and one. And there's no reason to, to, to believe that the BC Lions will slow down anytime sooner. And uh, you look at the weapons around them, you look at how, you know, cheap Nathan Rourke is this year and, and, and has, you know, and, and where that's, what's that resulted for the rest of the BC Lions roster. And it's just, you know, you see guys like Brian Burnham, who's been in this league for a long time, saying things like, you know, it's an honor to play for him. And, I'm, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to think years down the road about how lucky I was to be able to play with such a talent. And so when you have those kind of words spoke by not just his teammates, but players around the league and, and how special it is, it really is nice to be able to bask in it, whether you're a Bombers fan or wherever else. What Nathan Rourke is doing right now, right here, uh, is an incredible feat, Canadian or otherwise. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, Amr, let's move on. Um, for, first of all, big news yesterday from the media side. What did you think when you heard that Sarah O oh was uh, going to be finishing up her TSN tenure with the Banjo Bowl and is now, uh, you know, a member of the Jets? Oh man, how do I how do I hide and pretend I'm happy? Um, no, obviously, I you know, great news for Sarah and her family. It, you know, it creates a lot of opportunity for. Uh, for her in, in that situation, what I understand, it's going to be a bit less travel. She's got, you know, a teenager that's, uh, that has a pretty hectic sports schedule. And so I think it's going to provide her and her family with a lot of uh, great things. You, uh, you know how much I, you know how highly I think of Sarah Oleski. I, you know, I everybody tweeted, does. You know, everybody does. And I've tweeted out many a times of just how lucky we are as a, as a city and a province to have her represent the sports scene. Um, and all that. And I mean, you know what, uh, you know, I look forward for, for her to, to enjoy the, the Jets. The reason why, I, I, you know, I opened up with a joke is because I'm going to miss her, you know, at football <laughs> games. She's no longer going to be on the sidelines at CFL and TSN. And that is a massive hit uh, for the league and for, for that broadcast. Um, you know, she's the ultimate professional. I've been lucky enough to share a, you know, share a booth with her in the past for Jets coverage. And, and I always marvel at her ability to you know just provide insight and and really just great reporting um and just being an, a pro's pro like i don't you know there's not enough adjectives to describe the qualities of sarah Oleski and and you know the jets got a good one and i think we can definitively say it's the best move the winnipeg jets have made <laughs> this off season which bodes extremely well for them off the ice unfortunately i'm not sure how much sarah is going to be able to provide on the ice but maybe yeah. it turns around a bit of a gloomy organization well you know what you're exactly right i mean gloom there has been a lot of gloom and you know sarah puts a smile on everybody's face um and has done such a great work has so much respect in this market and uh, i mean it's a home run hire for the team they did not wait long to put her to work, though, and um, basically moments after it was announced that she was on board with the club, the first order of business was to uh, sit down with Mark Shifley and try and, you know, put a smile on his face. He certainly did have that. Um, I have to ask you, we've spent a lot of time talking about Shifley's situation. We hadn't heard from him since the infamous end-of-season interview. Um what, what did you what did you think about Shife? What he had to say yesterday and uh, his explanation for uh, how it was taken. Hey man, I need to apologize to everybody because apparently what we heard him say at the end of the season last year was absolutely garbage, and it turned into a media firestorm or whatever disaster. I think he referred to it as. You know, I thought it was interesting. I mean, what do you expect? 
I mean, this was, you know, clearly he knew he was sitting down for this interview. He knew what the questions were going to be. I'm sure he thought about it at some points over the offseason on what he was going to say. You know, I mean, it's, you know, he did say, you know, to his credit, he did say that he loves Winnipeg. He said it more than one time. You know, he never, I mean, he mentioned in that interview, he, he said it was a great community that gave him a lot and whatever. He didn't say that. I went back and checked through that just to make sure that, you know, whatever, and that he wanted to, you know, the words, I want to be a Winnipeg Jet. Uh, were not set. I mean, you say like to be here and all those things, but they came with a massive but, and that but was all individual. It was all, what do I need? This is my prime. This is my, you know, like he went into his own body type and how much he liked where his body was and how he needed to do it for him and his family. And all those things are, are, are in my opinion, fine. I mean, they're fine in the sense of you can, you certainly have to think about your family, your future, your career, your opportunities, your next contract. All those things is what every single player in the NHL says and ha- or sorry thinks and has to focus on. It's just they don't usually say it at the end of a you know a, at the end of a you know press at the end of a season press conference. And I, and, you know I, I mean I, did the media run with it and say it and, and say that you know and, and start this you know potential trade speculation and, and and have we talked about it for weeks and months on here and, and, and other places? Absolutely. But when you have somebody that has two years left on their contract. And, you know, and for somebody who, let's face it, I mean, Mark Mark certainly lit up the stat sheet. I mean, he was more than a point per game player and, and you need those guys on teams, but he was an absolute liability in his own end. And at times, you know, several times over the season appeared to just completely give up on the team. So with that as the backdrop, to then say all the things that he said and then to say, I love Winnipeg, but I need to do this. I need to ask my boss tough questions. I need to know the direction of the of the of where this team is headed. I need to know all these things before I can give you a clear answer. I mean, how would you not expect, you know, writers and, and people out there to jump on those things and make headlines out of it? I mean, if you don't know that by now, I mean, maybe that was the lesson you needed, I suppose. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I mean, was it a little bit hyperbolic of, of him trade being traded? Sure. But that's, you know, that again, that's, that's what, that's what sports is nowadays. It's all about finding the, you know, what the next headline is and, and what to talk about and whatever, and filling the airwaves over a long summer. And, you know, Mark could have done a lot of things to, to, you know, put, you know, take the fire out. I saw, I saw one Twitter follower. I forget who it was. So I apologize, but credit to them where he said, yeah, you know, the, 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 uh, the the media provided the gasoline. I hope I don't get this wrong, but but Mark provided the match, and so you know it, it really is it really is a two way street in those things. And and for him to just kind of you know have his first media availability to come out and say, well, oh, I thought I was, and then um, until the media said this, like, so did you think you were going to get traded afterwards? I mean, um, I will say this: Mark had several conversations with the Jets, including with Mark Chipman over the summer to you know get his you know head in head in check. I think and to get Why do you think some answers to those questions. Well, <laughs> I think that happened, ex- you know, particularly because of Pierre Luc Dubois' situation. I think you know, I think they circled back to Mark. Um, well, under- listen, I think that happened even before anything happened with PLD. I mean, it happened because of what he had to say. First of all, well, no, how of the course, season went for him, but at the end, I mean, as he said, you know what? Listen, I, I mentioned this earlier on. We don't need to relitigate all that. I mean, everyone Love heard it. what they heard. The fans reacted as they did. Media talked about it as obviously they're going to. And listen, that resonated within True North as well. I mean, all of those meetings they had with Mark Shifley, that didn't happen the year before. There was a reason for all of that. Well, that and he being... addressed it. And I would say this. He addressed it in that thing, okay? He addressed it with the media at the golf tournament after. He wants to be a Winnipeg Jet now, and so we can move forward and, and move on with the season. And I think at the end of the day, whether he was a Winnipeg, especially because he's a Winnipeg Jet still, doesn't matter what he said at the end of last season. doesn't matter what he said at this, you know, this, this last day. What's going to matter is is how he shows up to camp and how he you know how he produces early on in the season. How you know what kind of game? Like he talked about altering his trait his training. He talked about you know doing things that he hadn't done in the past to to better serve not just him but the Winnipeg Jets. So let's give him the benefit of the doubt when he comes to training camp, and I think the proof will be in the pudding and what he can put forth this season for a team that again at times it just seemed like he was disinterested last. Year. Well, it, exactly, and I mean I'll, I'll say this: I mean part of the reason why I think people made so much about it is because of how damn important he is to this hockey team, 
and when he's on, how effective he can be, and when he's off with how important he is, what that does to the hockey club. And, you know, we'll be talking, and listen, I guess there's still the possibility that this team goes into next year, and I mean, it's sort of been a talking point we've heard from a few guys. Oh, everyone thought we were great last year, and, you know, we disappointed, but there's, we, there's still the talent is still there. I'm not sure that there's any single player that can have a bigger effect on the atmosphere around the team and the performance on the ice than a fully engaged, motivated, and positive and happy Mark Shifley. And it sounded like that was the guy yesterday. And for me, as a guy that wants to see this team do well, that's buying tickets to go watch them each and every night, that's the Mark Shifley that I hope we'll see from game number one till game number 82 and hopefully into the playoffs because that is the guy, if he feels that he can be the change and is the change, we might actually see some change on the ice. Yeah, certainly. It sounds like you should just call him up and say exactly that, Pat. I think, you know, you know, don't let him know that you were the one that I was just happened to be guilty by association was the one that planted the seed of trading Mark Shifley. So, you know, here we are all these months later eating crow and uh, waiting for a season and, and you're giving him well, a I hope, talk to, There's to nothing I hope back. more. There's nothing I hope more than eat crow. Although, to be perfectly honest, the entire yeah, know, concept... right. The entire concept of trading Mark Shifley was... I mean, that was way earlier in the season. That was before we sort of... Seeing him, I think, cool. appear appear disinterested. It was more, you know, this was more sort of like, you know, big picture GMing. When you look at the contracts on the team, who's got the most value? Are you signing this guy after the deal is done and what that would cost for you? Um, you know, he's an incredible asset that probably at times took a little bit of a hit last year. Um, but both for him personally, for a new contract, for the team, whether he stays here, whether he's going somewhere else, a big season for Mark Shifley, a great attitude, and being a leader, being a guy worthy of that letter on his chest, to me, is the most important thing going into this season, assuming that he's going to be there. And then on top of it all, when you mentioned the Pierre-Luc Dubois situation, um, let's face it, by the end of the year, with the way Shifley was playing and what Dubois was doing on the ice, if you ask most people following this team who the number one center was, um, it would have been 50-50, if not maybe more in Dubois' side. It's been a crazy off season, but there's been a lot of things that have sort of gone in Mark's direction, despite the way it ended for him. And I think that if he comes in sounding like he did yesterday, positive, he will have the full support of the fan base right off the bat, and he'll go back to being the guy that they need him to be if they want to win hockey games on a regular basis. Well, think about it, right? All these guys who have two years left on their deal, whether whether that's, you know, Mark Shifley, whether that's Pierre-Luc Dubois, whether that's, well, I guess Pierre-Luc Dubois is two years before he's a UFA, he's on a one-year deal this year, um, you know, Connor Hellebuck, all that. I mean, if you want motivation for your next contract, well, that's going to be a lot of motivated guys there, right, to get things done and to, and to, and to prove it. I think what's going to be the big thing next season um, will be obviously adapting to a new coach. Was the coaching situation you know, the big thing is, is that going to be the thing that turns around, you know, again, as you mentioned, a roster that we thought heading into the season was, you know, certainly playoff quality, maybe even Stanley Cup contender quality is, is, a, is a new coach and Rick Bonus and his staff. Are they going to be the ones that are going to be able to are going to be able to, you know, bring out the best in this team? I think it's not just coaching. If you look at the guys, you know, and their reaction to Paul Maurice, I think everybody loved Paul Maurice for the most part. I'm not saying he was beloved by everyone in that locker room, but it was certainly a shock uh, for them to, to lose him. And so it might just be structure, right? I don't think it's necessarily finding that coach that's a cheerleader, but I do think that Rick Bonus is a player's coach. I think he's viewed as a, you know, a, a straight shooter, but also a guy who gets his, a great communicator who gets his matches across in the right way. Maybe that will be enough to, you know, because a lot of, you know, a lot of, co a lot of the coach's job, um, while obviously important on the ice and, and, you know, strategies and all those things and, and, you know, everything that goes into to playing a game, it's almost as much off the ice and making sure that guys, you know, are, you know, cause you have essentially, you know, 30 guys in, on, on your team, whether they're, you know, whether they're on the roster or just off of it, that all kind of want to know what's going on with them, with their current situations pretty much every single day. So if you have a good communicator in Rick Bonus, maybe that does, a bit of an edge or at least an upgrade from last season as far as the as the room but i i really do think you know you can have as talented a roster as you want um but if you're not gelling in you know as a team as as a group as a you know if you're not willing 
to go through a wall for the guy, you know, to, to the next to you sitting next to you in the locker room, as was as was not the case last year, as we heard from several players talk about it, particularly Paul Stastny on that exact line. You're not going to win anything because, you, you know, you, you're not you don't just win a Stanley Cup based purely on talent. You need talent and you need chemistry as a group. And so I think that's going to be the big thing here for the Winnipeg Jets. They obviously did nothing over the offseason. So they've decided to to run it back with this group, ending, you know, any kind of last minute fireworks for the roster. I just don't know if that is going to be enough for this team without getting some of those upgrades again from chemistry and culture in the room to the coaching. Will that be enough to gel this team to a point where they are competing, where they are making the playoffs and they're going deep into it? You know, again, I'd love to say absolutely yes, but I don't know at all. And so it's something we're going to have to wait and see. Um, you know, see if it comes to fruition. Yeah. I'll, I'll, that being said, I still do expect some changes to happen before the end of the season. And, uh, you know, it was funny. We were talking to Tom Gazzola yesterday in Edmonton and we were kicking around, oh, what's up with Jesse PRV and whatnot. And, you know, the, the Oilers are one of like 10 teams in the league that have to dish salary before the end of the year. And now that the RFAs are signed and Kevin Chevalier knows exactly what sort of um, room he has to add when it comes to the cap, to me, that is the most valuable asset that he's got in his uh, in his bag right now. And there's a number of teams that are going to need to make moves. And I still expect, and I'll say this right now, August 16th or whatever it is, I expect before the drop of the puck, and whether this happens in training camp beforehand, who knows, uh, I think the patience of Shevel Dayoff is going to be to his benefit right now because they do have the ability to take on salary. And I think that you can probably kill two birds with one stone. Move somebody off the blue line, bring in a player making more money that you can put into the forward group or potentially a couple of players. It solves some of the problems with the log jam on the blue line and gives some more opportunity for some of the younger players. Move some of the cap distribution to the forward group. And bottom line, helps your forward group because that, when you look at the roster right now, is where they absolutely need to uh, get a little bit more pop. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I don't really agree. Um, I think they have pop. I think they could use a different kind of forward. I think for years they've kind of been drafting the same guy. Uh, I think this Rutger McGrody might be the exception in the fact that he's actually looks like he could be a power forward and not just a speedy guy, you know, which is, which is fine to have, but when you're drafting the same player seemingly year after year, you know, it doesn't really work. You need to kind of compliment. I think this team's missing a number one defenseman. Now that's nothing against Josh Morrissey. I, you know, I think he is a top end defenseman and he showed that with a bounce back season last year, but I see him more as a, you know, I, I need another guy who can, can, can eat up, you know, 30 minutes on any given night, you know, and I think that's the difference with, with the Jets here is that I think that their roster makeup that, you know, they're heavy, they're heavy up front. Now they did lose a little bit of that, obviously with Paul Stastny gone with Andrew Kopp gone. Um, but I, but I just think, you know, the way with the way Rick bonus plays with what he's going to expect from this roster. I mean, did anyone watch the playoffs this year? Like did they, did you not watch Dallas play Calgary? I mean, they tried to suffocate them defensively. So to 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 tweak, I just don't see any reason to add, you know, or tweak or bring in, you know, guys on forward when when clearly this is going to be a defensive game. Now, obviously, forwards can play defensive games. So if there were going to be additions, I think that you have, you know, maybe a more defensive forwards to fill that philosophy. But I'll be fascinated to see what the moves are because if you're going to lean on this defense, which although yes, I get it, it's a log jam. There's also a a lot of expectations for this group. Now, I think those expectations may not be as heavy when you exp with with a system that would you know ask for for the forwards to play an even greater role in defense. That's that's clearly going to help out the defensive group. But I do think you're going to look at a group that you know will get tired. Will spend you know I don't want to say a ton of time in their own end, but maybe more than than fans might like based on this strategy. And I do think that if you're going to effectively do what what, what Rick Bonus has done in the past, you're going to need some help on the defense. You're going to need another guy who can eat up a lot of minutes. And beyond beyond Josh Morrissey, I think there's a lot of young, exciting players. I think there's some, you know, some certainly some serviceable quality veterans, but I just don't know if there's enough high-end guys on that blue line well, um, to be that team. I mean, to be honest with you, that's one of the most difficult things to acquire in the league. And I'm I just not yeah, sure absolutely. that there's a number one defenseman hanging around. I, and I guess when I say pop, I mean, I just mean additions to this forward group, which there just isn't enough right now. 
and I, and I really believe that the cap space that Sheveldayoff has, more than players that he has to trade, will be what facilitates not only a deal, but I think gets the best value and adds to the roster in the most efficient way, which is certainly what the Jets are trying to do. Hey, just before we go, Bombers on the bye week, uh, what's keeping you busy? Uh, so I didn't get the week off. I'm still working. I'm doing some of the work I do when, let's just say, sports aren't front and center. So I, I'm always digging into a few different things that uh, that sometimes take months, sometimes take years. So I'm picking away at some of those kind of projects and uh yeah just staying busy and uh getting ready and getting ready for what will be a, a pretty uh pretty fun matchup next week I'll, I'll certainly watch the games this week as i always do but next week with the bombers back and calgary on deck i think it's going to be a, an interesting one for sure so just keeping busy Haas, as always hey we'll keep the phone on uh, Rima's away for a couple of weeks so i uh, might need to uh, tap you to maybe come and hang out in a bit of a different role than normally doing this but would love to have you on maybe a little bit more next week and we've got some uh, extra space with the brains of the operation taking a little bit thanks so much for doing this pal have a uh, have a great week enjoy the bye week for the media as well though i know you're working on stuff and uh, we'll definitely catch up next week really looking forward to the bombers next home game Always a pleasure, Haas. Thanks for having me on. Shout out to the commenters. Eh? They make this show. You got it. There is Jeff Hamilton with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk at Jeff K. Hamilton on Twitter. And you can check out all of his work in the Winnipeg Free Press. All right. We have an announcement, folks. Remo, if you want to get that link that I sent over to you and that, uh, that, and that, um, um, the uh, little poster from our friends at Little Brown Jug. Um, of course, you know, Little Brown Jug has been a great sponsor of ours since the early days of Winnipeg Sports Talk. We had a great time doing that live show. I've been teasing that we're doing a sports trivia night over at Little Brown Jug. And I wanted to give everyone with us live on YouTube and our podcast listeners the first chance to count themselves in. September 1st, Thursday. 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., yours truly will be putting together and hosting a sports trivia night over at Little Brown Jug. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, people that have known me for a long time have known that I was the uh, trivia host down at the ENC for so many years and had such a great time doing that and the pub stumpers. And we figured we wanted to do something specialized to sports. And obviously, with us being Winnipeg Sports Talk, with a few categories that really focus in some of our local teams as well. So it will be curated by myself and a couple of good friends. We're going to put together a real fun program. And the bottom line is there's going to be limited availability and space at Little Brown Jug. So we've got a link right now. Remo will throw that in the chat. Um, and essentially, you can just get buy tickets. Now, when I say buy tickets, uh, I think the tickets are $9. And uh, essentially, including taxes, that is is the cost of your first pint out at Little Brown Jug. All the beers will be ready. It's going to be great fun. Um, but um, go to the Eventbrite, uh, uh, the Eventbrite link, click on it, buy your tickets, and uh, again, essentially, you're just buying your first beer and counting yourself in for September 1st, Little Brown Jug, WST Sports Trivia Night. I cannot wait for this, and I hope to see many of you there it'll be an impromptu wst get together as well heading into the next season so grab your crew grab your tickets and we'll see you on september 1st great conversation with jeff talking bombers it is the bye week but next thursday we are back at it and the bombers are back at it at home and that means the princess auto tailgate party is getting going at 5 30 if you're heading to the game of course the sold out banjo bowl any blue bomber games get there early get to the princess auto tailgate enjoy cheap beers hot dogs pop dj finesse spinning and everything else that we got going on to make your game day that much better of course princess auto proud sponsors of the winnipeg blue bombers and the place you'll find the best deal and the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at princess auto two locations in winnipeg panet road portage avenue west and you can shop online 24 7 365 at princessauto.com looking forward to heading over to boston pizza after the show tonight meeting up with a friend maybe you have a few beers and wings for happy hour great happy hour promos three to six and nine to twelve at your local boston pizza and of course boston pizza remains the best place to get together with your gang to watch the big game no bombers this week but 
The struggling Blue Jays are still on the tube. And of course, a great slate of Canadian Football League action and hockey season just around the corner. Pop by your neighborhood BP today. And if you're staying at home, check out their game day deals and order online at bostonpizza.com. And a big shout out to Nick and Nikki over at Nick and Nikki DQ. Miracle Treat Day last year, last week was a huge success, raising money for the Children's Hospital and the Children's Miracle Network. Uh, and of course, it is summer right now. Another gorgeous day. What could be better than a trip down to one of the Nick and Nikki DQs for a blizzard? Hit them up at DQ Neverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, or DQ St. Anne's. Check out all the new blizzard flavors. Try a stack burger. And hey, if you need a cake, hit them up on uh, DQ Manitoba on Instagram. They'll get that cake custom made for you to pick up quick and easy at any of the Nick and Nicky DQs. All right, we got Cool Bet Lines, the Cinnaboy Downs picks later on. I can't wait, though, for this next conversation. There is so much crazy stuff happening in the world of golf. It seems like one never-ending soap opera. And who better to talk about that with than our man, Mark Zacchino, who's just back from the FedEx and the FedEx Cup playoffs to join us on Winnipeg Sports Talk Now. What's going on, Z Man? Uh, taking a little breath. You got a got a tea time later on, or what's that? I know. I'm actually going to try to play golf today. W what a concept! I mean, um, yeah, it's been crazy. Uh, I guess it's good crazy in a way. Uh, three weeks in a row, I did Detroit for radio. I did Wyndham for PGA Tour Live, and then I did uh, FedEx St. Jude Championship, the first playoff event for radio again. So three weeks in a row on the road. Golf Talk Canada is still going while this is going on. So sooner or later, uh, I mean, we're, we're going to slow down a little. So I'm starting to get into that season where we're new Golf Talk Canada the next couple of weeks. And then once the FedEx Cup is handed out, we'll really slow down. We're not going away, but we'll uh, we'll get into a normal uh, pace for the, the remainder of the year. But I mean, the news cycle, to your point, though, is in insane because – just because golf might be winding down and we're going to hand out the FedEx Cup and then a President's Cup, I got a feeling that the the soap opera that is uh, Live Golf, Lawsuits, PGA Tour, Tiger arriving in private jets, the secret meetings, I mean, this could go on the entire winter. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that it will. And, um, I mean, we'll get to yesterday uh, with the big cat getting on the private jet from Jupiter and rolling in to uh, meet with the other heavy hitters on the PGA Tour. Uh, just before we get to that, though, Mark, I mean, you've been around. You just mentioned the last three tournaments. How much oxygen was uh, the Live Tour taking out of these events? I mean, the golf was incredible, and we saw an amazing playoff. Willis Torres getting his final win, and Zinger very correctly saying no amount of guaranteed money can capture that sort of magic. But it is impossible to escape when you're talking about professional golf right now, especially here, North America, PGA Tour, to be talking about what is happening with Liv. It's the same in every tournament. It goes back to the Canadian Open, uh, week of the RBC Canadian Open, when Dustin Johnson pulled the shoot and joined Liv, you know, when he's the face of the of the RBC brand and its connection to golf. Uh it's the same thing. It sucks the air out of the balloon early in the week. And the closer you get to Sunday, the less people care. And by the time you get to Saturday, no one's talking about live. And by the time you get to Sunday, no one's even remembered live. And then it returns again on Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning. So they, they seem to do a really great job of grabbing headlines and making news. Uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and then and then the other days it has less and less impact because I think Zinger is a thousand percent right. I had, I had a chance to sit with Paul actually and have a coffee on the Sunday morning. We were talking a little bit about the whole Cameron Smith penalty situation and and just the whole way that the crowd was kind of the crowds were very respectful in Memphis, but there were groups of people that were poking Cameron Smith the the entire week. Um, and there's definitely an us versus them, you know, energy in the air, so to speak. So, uh, but, but yeah, you're right. Sunday afternoon, I mean, no one remembers it and you can't, you can't create that. You can't throw money at that. And I'm biased. I work for the tour and, and I love professional golf and I love competition and I don't look at live as competition. I, I mean, I look at it more as exhibition, and that's fine. People can like exhibitions. We've had skins games. 
We've had, you know, made for TV events like the match between Tiger and Phil and, you know, all those things. But I'm, to me, they're different. To me, Liv has yet to. Now, it's early. Maybe things look different five years from now. I don't know. But at this point, Liv has not created a single headline or has not created anything that people are captivated about or interested in with anything actually happening on the golf course. And that's certain. All their headlines, all their news, all their attention has been for things that are not golf related. That are things outside the ropes, in courtrooms, in headlines, and clickbait. Um, so, so I think maybe that's the reason why when we get to Sunday that they tend to go away. You know, Z, golf fans like myself, um, you know, I think everyone has had one of their favorite guys. There's a lot of filler guys. Well, he was first out. I mean, DJ stunned a lot of people. For the most part, and again, this is just my perspective, it was more some of the more unlikable guys that were leaving, and a lot of people were saying good riddance. I'll be honest, I was really, really choked when I heard that Cam Smith had one and a half feet out the door, and then that he was playing in the FedEx Cup playoffs. Um, Number two in the world, players champion, open champion. Um, what was uh, what was his reception like uh, over the course of last week? I mean, did you notice a different... Uh, approach from the fan base as well as players and people around to cam it must have been incredibly awkward awkward is a great word and you know they had a players only meeting at the bmw championship uh yesterday as you know and you know cameron smith you know withdrew from the bmw championship conveniently conveniently complaining about soreness in his hip I mean, too much money in his right pocket. <laughs> you know, maybe Cameron Smith is, has always carried himself as a very decent guy and a good guy. And to your point, he doesn't line up with Kepka, Reed, Shambo. I mean, to your point again, the list of guys that have gone to live, the majority of them, not all of them, Ian Poulter, a lot of the biggest, um, you know, Players that have rubbed other players and fans the wrong way. Very diplomatic. <laughs> line up on Liv, right? Oh, they all go to Liv. Okay. Cameron Smith is not one of those guys. So this would have been a very awkward um, thing for him. This is not Patrick Reed, who's who's very comfortable in awkward situations, who's very comfortable with walking into a locker room with everybody looking at him the wrong way. Okay, this is not Cameron Smith is not that guy. So to your point, awkward, awkward, awkward. The one thing with Cameron Smith, though, is he's Australian. And the Australian players, they look up to Greg Norman. Uh, the Australian players also feel like that market, that golf market, has been neglected. They're not incorrect. The PGA Tour um, and the DP World Tour, for that matter, has kind of neglected that marketplace, but there's a reason for it. Now, the PGA Tour did, is doing the best they can. They, they brought the President's Cup there, Royal Melbourne. It was a success. But it is a horrible time zone, and the PGA Tour needs to do what is best for the tour in terms of eyeballs on television and what's, in, what's better for the players and the sponsors. And unfortunately, when you go to Australia in the middle of the night, those things don't line up. So you've, you've got two things colliding here. You've got an amazing golf market in Australia with amazing fan base, incredible golf courses that are starved for first-class PGA Tour world-class golf. But, but unfortunately, it doesn't line up with those other things like sponsors and eyeballs. So the market overall has been neglected over the last decade or so. And live has decided that they're going to go in there next year and fill that market, and they're not going to neglect it. And you've got Australians looking up to Greg Norman that want to have big time, in their minds, big time event golf. I say in their minds because Live to me is yet to provide big time golf. Um, and they feel that this might fill that gap. So there's a lot of things lining up, obviously, plus a bunch of money that you don't have to, to win, a bunch of money that you just get to, sh to show up. So I see why a Cameron Smith heads in that direction. Uh, it saddens me to your point. He's now the first name that has really bothered me, if this is true. To be honest with you, no other name that is left has really bothered me to this point. 
I couldn't care less where all these guys are going to play golf. They, to me, they didn't move the needle. To, to me, uh, most of them are on the, the back nine of their career, with the exception of maybe one or two. A, um, obviously, um, Taylor Gooch, uh, you know, DeChambeau still had some golf, I think, left in them. Uh, but the majority of these guys have uh, brand equity for things they did 10, 15 years ago. No, it's a great point. Mark Zacchino, Golf Talk Canada, PGA Tour Radio with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Well, I mean, yesterday the big story was, as we mentioned, the big cat uh, coming in to the BMW Championship and meeting. What do we know about the meeting, Mark? Uh, from you know, like It was a smaller group of players than I think wow. I originally thought. The commissioner, Jay Monahan, apparently was not there. Um, but listen, when Tiger comes from Florida there for a specific meeting, um, and he is the biggest icon in the sport. Um, it, obviously, there's lots going on behind the scenes. I mean, do we know much about what was going to be addressed and anything that's come out of it? So I've been I've been online all morning texting guys that I think might know something all morning. I mean, this envelope is sealed. Like, are we going to get something over the next few days? Eventually, something's someone's going to say something to somebody. What we know now, to your point, is this is a select group of big names with influence that, that were invited to this meeting, and that is it. The other thing that we know in this meeting is that nothing at all was off the table. This was, okay, what, what is our next move? What are we going to do? What does this group of select influencers, uh, what is on the table for these guys? And to, and to that point, I mean, I've, I've heard that, you know, boycotting of majors was an item of discussion, which to me is just like, wow, okay. In other words, if the majors don't pick a pony in this race, then we would consider this. Not saying they're going to do it, but that was something that was brought up by Davis Love III several weeks ago, and that was certainly an item of discussion in this meeting, along with numerous other things. So what comes out of this, I don't know. But I think this, I'm starting to get the feeling that this was more of, okay, go around the room. These are the biggest names in the game that have put their flag in the ground with the PGA Tour. And they said, okay, we're PGA Tour guys. Here's the flag. We're the ones that carry influence on Team PGA Tour. We're only as strong as we are as a collective. So what collectively are we really, where are our lines in the sand? What are our moves? What would we consider when and why? I think that's what this was about. I don't think there's any going to be any decisions out of this meeting. I don't think there's going to be any uh, earth moving items that come from this meeting, but I do think this is, is more, uh, okay, guys, what page are, are we on here? And, and, and where do you, you know, where are we going with, I think it was more one of those. I again could be completely wrong, but that seems to be the sensation that, that we're that, that we're getting. So, and that's important because you know uh, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, Justin Thomas, Ricky Fowler, John Rahm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, Scotty Scheffler. I mean, they need to be on the same page at, at this point because the one thing the live guys have been. Uh, regardless of why they have been unified they've been unified with show me the money they got the money uh, and now they're gone i would say this there is a group of them over at live uh, and good on them that want nothing to do with these lawsuits and pulled their name away from these lawsuits saying hey guys i don't need anything to do with that i took the check i resigned from the pga tour i'm playing golf over here now I have no desire or interest in suing the PGA Tour. So there is a group, obviously, there is a group of them that don't want anything to do with that. So so good on them for that. Well, Z, speaking of lawsuits, I, like you, was sitting around last night, you know, refreshing every five minutes to see if I could get some information on this meeting with Tiger and was blessed with the comedy of the Patrick Reed lawsuit against Brandel Chambly and the Golf Channel for 700 and fifty million dollars. Um, I'm just gonna say right out, I'm no lawyer, but this is one of the most insane pieces of legalese I've ever read. 
I mean, what was your reaction to that? And what are your, uh, what are your associates around the golf world saying about what Pat Reed is up to right now? This is absolutely ridiculous. And if you Google his lawyer's name, a lot, you'll figure out a lot right away. This guy is like a renegade, uh, real piece of work. I mean, no reputable lawyer is going to, to, to give any credence to any of this. This is an absolute joke. This is more BS from Liv. This is what they're about, right? They're renegade disturbers that um, I don't know. I, I, you know I, I could go off on an hour on, on, on some of these guys, but I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, I simply tweeted out one thing. I, I said, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I tweeted out small gif of Patrick Reed dragging back the sand in the bunker <laughs> To create a lane for him to to clip a we- uh, clip a wedge out of out of a bunker, uh, you know, one of numerous violations and questionable uh, callings he's had over his career, and there are dozens. And I'm I, I was reading last night on uh, on Twitter, it's like, well, if this actually gets to court, which it's not, this is going to get like thrown out immediately. But if it ever got to court, I mean, could you imagine going back there? It is right there. I mean, could you imagine going back to uh, his college days and lining up his coach and his teammates and all the people in college that accused him of cheating and accused him of suspect behavior, et cetera? I mean, this is not a PGA Tour thing that happened once or twice. Uh, So I I don't really know where this is coming from. This is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's laughable. (laughs) Surprised he wasn't going to be uh, represented by Justine in court. Wouldn't that? That's the only way it could get funnier. To be perfectly honest with you, um, Z. Before we go, there is a big tournament right now. Will Zalatoris coming off his uh, first win in an absolutely bizarre playoff. I mean, mm-hmm. that shot, that shot on the par three bounced seven times. It reminded me of Kawhi Leonard's shot for the Raptors <laughs> against the Sixers a couple of years ago. Uh, but we now get down to the final seventy. Um, just give us a little preview of the BMW Championship and uh, maybe a couple guys that might uh, have your fancy if we were going to throw a nickel down on them. You know, it's really hard this week because we don't have any kind of horses for courses. When we look at these, like when I look at, and I've had a great year when it comes to fantasy golf, right? I mean, um, I don't know what it's been this year, but I've been really lucky with uh, breaking this down. And I look at it two ways, you know, like, you know, who's hot uh, at the moment and uh, what kind of golf course are we playing and, and, and out of who's hot does their style of play, you know, reflect to the venue we're going. And then I look at horses for courses. I look like who's had a great history here. I like, and it's really hard this week because we're at a venue that has no history. We're at a venue that, that we're kind of guessing uh, what we've heard of what type of play might do well here. Whereas next week when we get to East Lake, I mean, it, it's a small field of 30. We know who's playing well. we got tons of – it's a much easier uh, way of breaking it down next week. So this week was very hard. What I've heard about this golf course is that it, it tends to be a ball strikers golf course and uh, it tends to have uh, a very, uh, strokes gained off the tee is an important category. I really felt like I was flying blind this week. John Rahm has kind of been a little asleep at the wheel. Last week, he led the field in greens and regulation, struck the ball well. It's been the putter all year for him. Apparently, this week, it, it's not going to be a putting contest. So maybe John Rahm wakes up a little bit here. Matthew Fitzpatrick led the field in strokes gain, approach to green last week. He's been a great driver of the golf ball, had a huge summer you kind of see him kind of picking up the pace a little. Sanjay M has been incredible the last three, four weeks and just can't win. So there's guys on the radar, but this is a very hard week. I'm also watching the Canadians, right? We have four random whites in that top 70. How many of these guys can we get to Eastlake? They need to play well. They cannot have a bad week and make it to Eastlake. And I really thought that we had a good chance of getting two players to the Tour Championship this this year, and now we're fighting to get one player there. Corey Connors, obviously, with the, the player in the best position. But uh, Taylor Penrith, uh, Adam Hadwin, and Mackenzie Hughes are all playing the BMW Championship. They need big weeks uh, to solidify not just getting to the Tour Championship, but they have an opportunity to be on the President's Cup team. And that President's Cup team's in a couple of weeks. And if Cam Smith bolts to live, 
And if Hideki Matsuyama gets $400 million to go to live so that they can open up the Asian TV market, now we've got a bunch of open spots on the President's Cup team. And we've got Canadians playing well. And no one's playing better right now than Taylor Pender. We could have a bunch of Canadians on this team. So this is a really important week for Team Canada. Hey, just on the way out, this is a Tony Finau show. I am a Tony Finau guy. Back-to-back wins. and not, I mean, for a, a long course with ball striking, I, I, is anyone playing more consistently right now than Tony? No, and he should be on everybody's radar right now. And why? And you know what? Awesome story. Because if you're looking for somebody to cheer for, that's a guy. I mean, not only is he stupid, superior talented, he's incredibly talented, just naturally gifted. Kids at an absolute mile. But then off the golf course is one of the nicest human beings on the planet. So, I mean, go Tony. Well done. I would love to see him win it all. It'd be awesome. Z-Man, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, you know, I, hopefully we can catch up before the President's Cup and hopefully be talking about a few more Canadians getting on the team after a great week at the BMW. I, I mean, the next three weeks, I'm, I'm grounded. I'm not traveling. So the next three weeks, uh, let, let's let's do it. Thanks so much, Z-Man. Have a great round. Hit him straight. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, great stuff with Z-Man. And, of course, the golf focus around town is going to be at Southwood, Manitoba Open tomorrow. And looking forward to uh, talking a little PGA Tour Canada and more about the tournament with the uh, Ed of PGA Tour Canada tomorrow. Scott Pritchard jumping on, and a thanks to Munzee for helping us hook that up. Uh, we'll also have Weeb's World. Ken Weeb jump on the program tomorrow. And yes, people wondering, it's Wednesday. No Marat today. He's on holidays for a couple of weeks, but don't you worry. He will be back very, very soon. Uh, gorgeous night tonight. Uh, yesterday was beautiful as well. Great night to sit in the backyard, maybe do a little barbecuing and grab a cc and ginger especially if you haven't tried it it is the drink of the summer folks the great taste of canadian club and ginger ale pre-mixed ready to drink available in six packs at your local beer store or manitoba liquor mart of course it's also available at ig field you can be sipping on those next thursday when the bombers take on the calgary stampeders canadian club official sponsor of the winnipeg blue bombers available throughout ig field for cocktails and, of course, the CC and ginger as well. Um, we have a little bit more to do here, including our Assiniboia Downs picks. But first of all, let's get to Cool Bet lines for today. And I'm just keeping an eye on Sweden-Latvia 0-0 right now at the World Junior Hockey Championships with just over five minutes left in the first period. Uh, but... One of the two legs are in for our World Junior Quarterfinal Parlay. Shout out to the Germans who covered the three and a half goal spread. They lost 5 2 earlier today in the first game. That would be to the Finns. And then needing Switzerland to hang on and lose by five or less to Canada. Canada, five and a half point, five and a half goal favorites against Switzerland and the United States of America in the late game against the Czechs. USA minus two and a half, laying minus 141. Uh, BMW Championship goes tomorrow. Just talked about that with the Z-Man. Uh, it is Rory McIlroy. It's all the big boys. I think this is going to be one of the top players that wins this tournament. McIlroy's 12 to 1. Rom 14. Scheffler and Justin Thomas, 16 to 1. Cantley, Finau, Fitzpatrick, Willie Z, all at 18. Xander Shoffley at 22. And Colin Morikawa, some pretty good value, I think, at 25. Played very well later on in the tournament to the FedEx Cup Championships. And you know he's got the game to uh, lock it in. And by the way, speaking of Cool Bet in the lock shop, huge thanks to Cool Bet. Dustin Nielsen and I have expanded the lock shop last night. We did our first episode together of the fantasy football extravaganza, breaking down all the quarterbacks. We'll do running backs, receivers, tight ends in the next couple of weeks. Those are going to be normally Tuesday nights as well, but wherever you get your podcasts, search Lock Shop, hit us with a sub, and uh, join us for a big expanded programming schedule coming into NFL season for September with the lock shop. And Hey, if you haven't played a cool bet before, use the promo code WST perfect time to do it. Heading into NFL season, 100% bonus on your first deposit up to 200 bucks. When you use the promo code WST. 
NFT. Uh, oh, Remo, I see Nude HD double uh, XYZ is back. Uh, big fans of the show. Uh, Nude XYZ seems to come in on most afternoons these days. Yeah, that's the new uh, the new spam bots we get banned banned from the chat. No bots, no bots allowed. So they were they were given the boot. The new love face of uh, of mm -hmm. Winnipeg sports talk and uh, real right. ones know can remember that through the entire season. Uh, all right. We both got goosed last night, some close calls at the track. And I was just looking at some of the odds for tonight, Reem, and I guess with what's happened, and I'm not sure, I'm this is just speculation, but because Wednesday night's um, program got canceled because of that insane weather, uh, we have some of the biggest fields I have ever seen for Assiniboia Downs races tonight. There are 12 horses going to post in the seventh, a number of eight, nine, and 10 horse races. This is going to be a tough one to pick, but if we can hit, it could be big time. This could be the most pivotal night of racing in our head-to-head -head matchup for the entire season. Yeah, I'm catching up on you. We both went, had a goose egg last night, minus 30 each, but I think I'm like 80 or $90 behind, so a big night today could swing it. In someone's favor, I think this is the last like the last month here of duel at the Downs. You and I going head to head. You got off to a hot start, but since July 18, the la or July 12th last month, I've been pretty hot myself. So, uh, although last night was a big buck. But Where yeah, are you going today? Some big races tonight. I got a lot of bets because we have to do thirty dollars. Um, like yeah, race, we, we, so we split our 20 from Monday with 10 yesterday. It yeah. didn't work out so well, but tonight, and I'm glad we've got the extra few extra bullets tonight because with all these horses, I got some picks. Yeah. Race one. I'm going, I mean, swag sational. That was uh, easy. That was an easy bet. Insta bet. I saw swag sational. I was thinking you did too, right? <laughs> I actually didn't end up betting race one, but I was thinking long and hard. If I was going to, I would have taken swag sational. Yeah. Is long and hard uh, a one you were going to take? You said you were thinking you were going to take long and hard? No, no. Is that a horse? I was just I thought I you said thinking. that it was. You said I was thinking long and hard. <laughs> no, no, no. I just. <laughs> that would be a good, horse, that'd be a good horse name though, right? <laughs> Sorry, I got, got thrown off there. <laughs> um, oh my race, God. Race two. I'm doing a Quinella here. Two five, not afraid, and Bomb Bill Gatto. I take that one all the time. Bomb Bill Gatto. It never works out, but I'll take it. Uh, race four, number three to win. Uh, race four, number three. That's Get Wit Gone. That's a long shot. Uh, I got to go for it. And race five. Uh, no one race six. I'm doing a six four Quinella, or a six four um, Uncle Mo's cat. I just love that name and high rise in the peg as well. And race seven, big twelve racer, and then True Kate. I'm going True Kate race race seven. So that's we might, how many, I've never seen that many horses uh, in a field here. Unbelievable, at the Downs. unbelievable. Twelve races for a horse. This would be a great night if you want to get an HPIBet.com account. Watch. On the ASD YouTube the channel, or I know my guy T Knot and the gang are heading out to the track tonight. It might be a great night to uh, to go do it yourself. All right, I did not take race one. Race number two, I'm going with a. What do we got? A one, two, eight Quinella. Uh, so that is big time Gizmo, not afraid, and double time. Uh, then I'm going to race number three, and we're going two, three, four. Little Miss Zach, Aramont, and Ragatag Tag for another. I've uh, kind of got, I think, a few triactor boxes. Uh, race four, I'm banging on uh, number one to show. And I've also got a four, six Quinella, which is finalized, and Jeff Fafa. And let's see here. Race five, two, three, and eight. Another triactor box. Uh, that would be Sista of War, Zenhi, and Sea of Life. That one hopefully will come through. That would be a big one. And I also have in race number six, a four, six, Quinella, uh, High Rise in the Peg, and Uncle Mo's Cat. Is that the same one that That's you just had? That's the same one. That's the same one. All right. Well, we'll see. How much did you bet on that one? I just I think I did five on every everyone. I did six oh. five dollar bets. 
nicely done nicely done so there you go folks there are picks tonight for the track great day to get out to assiniboia downs uh and of course it should be a great night as well big game between the gold eyes and the kansas city monarchs probably be heading down to the ballpark as well for that uh, excellent show today reem but one more for you we're going to bring in alex tomorrow he's going to help us uh get ready for uh, some time with you away and i guess the big question is friday show the first show ever without michael remus oh no i'm here sports Fr talk history i'm here friday Oh, you are here Friday. I'm here okay. this Friday. Yeah, I'm here. I'm leaving. But not Monday. Not Monday. So I have to leave immediately after the show and go to the airport. What's Friday. the cool bet line and whether we'll have more or less technical difficulties on Monday without you here than on yesterday's mm, show? Probably less. He's pretty good, Alex. He is. Well, I'm, yesterday's show was a bit of an aberration, I would say. Certainly not like a normal show. Anyways, that was That was fun. the Windows update. That was the Windows update. That wasn't me. <laughs> I I should have I shouldn't have done it. I don't I shouldn't have done it. But everyone says who's Alex? He's filling in for me. He does stuff with the uh, Wally and Mathacho and Daily Faceoff show. So he's gonna be making yeah, high level wst meetings today troubleshooting making sure we're ready yeah. to go but don't worry Remus here for the rest of the week i was having a shower this morning going oh my god if Remus is away for two weeks what are we gonna do about the marble race but the good thing is you'll be here on friday i think you're only missing one friday I'm missing right? one friday i'm missing one friday so we'll have to figure out something entertaining to do instead of the marble race uh for uh, for that show it um I was going to say, before we, we wrap, I do want to mention about this Hall of Fame game for the Jets Hall of Fame. Yeah. It is, uh, it is, they could, they put out, so they put out the teaser and like, I didn't stay tuned to their Twitter, but they put out shortly after that it is November 17 versus the Ducks. And um, what is it? November 17, they'll be honored. They put out this release for the matchup. And they're also having a gala on the Tuesday, the 15th, the first in-person gala for the Jets since 2019. Oh, wow. I've, I've been to that that gala before. It was I had a great time. I saw Tom Cochran there. It was awesome. Well, I'm and, glad. I've got my new suit from F Apparel, so I can actually put it on and wear it out for the first so. time since. I think I'll actually wear it at least once before then for a wedding I've got coming up. And, well, a few times on WST as well when we need to spice it up. But, uh be looking forward to that should be a great night and i mean two individuals that if you are of a certain age were probably uh your idols growing up mm -hmm. uh, both uh, tepo newman and anti mussolini such incredible members of um the jets organization the squad and the city and uh, that's going to be a real special week in winnipeg with those guys coming back to be entered into the winnipeg jets hall of fame yeah against the ducks too great opponent uh so mark that one on your calendar. That'll be fun to go to. I think we'll see a lot of Jets retro jerseys at that one. I do wonder, you know, we haven't heard about the reverse retro jersey, and there was a leak before saying they were going to be the Heritage logo, but I wonder if they don't bring this back Me too. for Me a too. special event game. I'd love to see it. I think it would be awesome. Maybe with red helmets, if we're lucky. <laughs> if we're lucky. Or, sorry, yeah, it was the red helmets they wore, the, wore like, briefly, but we'll see. Yeah, the uh, listen, the red helmets didn't last very long, I think, for a reason. That looks the red pants, though, for sure. And obviously, yes. the red pants were being this used is with a, the hair. It's a hot uniform. As well, the fact now that it's Solani and Newman and going, I think I would, if I was making the cool bet odds on what the jersey will be, I think it's gone from a plus number for the 90s Jets jersey now to a, a minus number right now. I think that would be the favorite, but again. All speculation as well. Canada, Switzerland coming up in the World Junior Hockey Championships. That game begins at 5 o'clock our time, I believe. And then a little later on, Canada or the uh, United States and the Czechs will break that down as uh, far as the semifinals tomorrow. And obviously, the gold medal game heading into the weekend as well. Manitoba open tomorrow. And uh, more on the uh, Jets offseason. Mark Shifley at the tournament and more as Ken Weebs just joins us tomorrow as well as more on the Manitoba Open. Folks, great show today. Thanks to everyone for popping by. Always welcome your comments. Give us a comment on the YouTube uh, channel. That always helps us. And hit us anytime on Twitter, at Sports Talk WPG, for those of you listening to the podcast. Uh, thanks to all the sponsors for making us uh, be able to do this show each and every day. And most of all, thanks to you for making us a part of your day, folks. Have a great night. 
Get outside, enjoy it, fish, play in the night, Assiniboia Downs, lots to do, even with the Bombers on the bye. And one thing you can count on, the boys are back tomorrow, 1 p.m., Winnipeg Sports Talk, right here. We'll see you then. Oh, my God! Oh! Shut it down! Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.